section thirty of germinal by emile zola translation by havelock ellis this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard part six chapter one the first fortnight of february passed and a black cold prolonged the hard winter without pity for the poor once more the authorities had scoured the roads the prefect of lille an attorney general and the police were not sufficient the military had come to occupy monceau a whole regiment of men were camped between bonnet and marchien armed pickets guarded the pits and there were soldiers before every engine the manager's villa the company's yards even the houses of certain residents were bristling with bayonets nothing was heard along the streets but the slow movement of patrols on the pit bank of the Voreux, a sentinel was always placed in the frozen wind that blew up there like a lookout man above the flat plain and every two hours as though in an enemy's country were heard the sentry's cries Give advance and give the password nowhere had work been resumed on the contrary the strike had spread Crecourt, miro madeleine like the Vero, were producing nothing at foutre cantel and the victoire there were fewer men every morning even at st thomas which had been hitherto exempt men were wanting there was now a silent persistence in the face of this exhibition of force which exasperated the miners pride the settlements looked deserted in the midst of the beetroot fields not a workman stirred only at rare intervals was one to be met by chance isolated with sidelong look lowering his head before the red trousers and in this deep melancholy calm in this passive opposition to the guns there was a deceptive gentleness a forced and patient obedience of wild beasts in a cage with their eyes on the tamer ready to spring on his neck if he turned his back the company who were being ruined by this death of work talked of hiring miners from the borinage on the belgian frontier but did not dare so that the battle continued as before between the colliers who were shut up at home and the dead pits guarded by soldiery on the morrow of the terrible day this calm had come about at once hiding such a panic that the greatest silence possible was kept concerning the damage and the atrocities the inquiry which had been opened showed that maigrat had died from his fall and the frightful mutilation of the corpse remained uncertain already surrounded by a legend on its side the company did not acknowledge the disasters it had suffered any more than the gregoires cared to compromise their daughter in the scandal of a trial in which she would have to give evidence however some arrests took place mere supernumeraries as usual silly and frightened knowing nothing by mistake Piron was taken off with handcuffs on his wrists as far as marchand's to the great amusement of his mates rosnor also was nearly arrested by two gendarmes the management was content with preparing lists of names and giving back certificates in large numbers Mehu had received his levaque also as well as thirty-four of their mates in the settlement of the deux cents alone and all the severity was directed against etienne who had disappeared on the evening of the fray and who was being sought although no trace of him could be found chaval in his hatred had denounced him refusing to name the others at catherine's appeal for she wished to save her parents the days passed every one felt that nothing was yet concluded and with oppressed hearts every one was awaiting the end at Monceau, during this period the inhabitants awoke with a start every night their ears buzzing with an imaginary alarm bell and their nostrils haunted by the smell of powder but what completed their discomfiture was a sermon by the new curé abbe ranvier that lean priest with eyes like red-hot coals who had succeeded abbe joie he was indeed unlike the smiling discreet man so fat and gentle his only anxiety was to live at peace with everybody abbe ranvier went so far as to defend these abominable brigands who had dishonoured the district he found excuses for the atrocities of the strikers he violently attacked the middle class 
throwing on them the whole of the responsibility it was the middle class which by dispossessing the church of its ancient liberties in order to misuse them itself had turned this world into a cursed place of injustice and suffering it was the middle class which prolonged misunderstandings which was pushing on towards a terrible catastrophe by its atheism by its refusal to return to the old beliefs to the fraternity of the early christians and he dared to threaten the rich he warned them that if they obstinately persisted in refusing to listen to the voice of god god would surely put himself on the side of the poor he would take back their fortunes from those who faithlessly enjoyed them and would distribute them to the humble of the earth for the triumph of his glory the devout trembled at this the lawyer declared that it was socialism of the worst kind all saw the cure at the head of a band brandishing a cross and with vigorous blows demolishing the bourgeois society of eighty nine m hennebeau when informed contented himself with saying as he shrugged his shoulders if he troubles us too much the bishop will free us from him and while the breath of panic was thus blowing from one end of the plain to the other etienne was dwelling beneath the earth in jean lynn's burrow at the bottom of Requillard. it was there that he was in hiding no one believed him so near the quiet audacity of that refuge in the very mine in that abandoned passage of the old pit had baffled search above the sloes and hawthorns growing among the fallen scaffolding of the belfry filled up the mouth of the hole no one ventured down it was necessary to know the trick how to hang on to the roots of the mountain ash and to let go fearlessly to catch hold of the runs that were still solid other obstacles also protected him the suffocating heat of the passage a hundred and twenty metres of dangerous descent then the painful gliding on all fours for a quarter of a league between the narrowed walls of the gallery before discovering the brigand's cave full of plunder he lived there in the midst of abundance finding gin there the rest of the dried cod and provisions of all sorts the large hay bed was excellent and not a current of air could be felt in this equal temperature as warm as a bath light however threatened to fail jean lynn who had made himself purveyor with the prudence and discretion of a savage and delighted to make fun of the police had even brought him pomatum but could not succeed in putting his hands on a packet of candles after the fifth day etienne never lighted up except to eat he could not swallow in the dark this complete and interminable night always of the same blackness was his chief torment it was in vain that he was able to sleep in safety that he was warm and provided with bread the night had never weighed so heavily on his brain it seemed to him even to crush his thoughts now he was living on thefts in spite of his communistic theories old scruples of education arose and he contented himself with gnawing his share of dry bread but what was to be done one must live and his task was not yet accomplished another shame overcame him remorse for that savage drunkenness from the gin drunk in the great cold on an empty stomach which had thrown him armed with a knife on cheval this stirred in him the whole of that unknown terror the hereditary ill the long ancestry of drunkenness no longer tolerating a drop of alcohol without falling into homicidal mania would he then end as a murderer when he found himself in shelter in this profound calm of the earth seized by satiety of violence he had slept for two days the sleep of a brute gorged and overcome and the depression continued he lived in a bruised state with bitter mouth and aching head as after some tremendous spree a week passed by the Mahirs, who had been warned were not able to send a candle he had to give up the enjoyment of light even when eating now etienne remained for hours stretched out on his hay vague ideas were working within him for the first time a feeling of superiority which placed him apart from his mates an exultation of his person as he grew more instructed never had he reflected so much he asked himself the why of his disgust 
on the morrow of that furious course among the pits and he did not dare to reply to himself his recollections were repulsive to him the noble desires the coarse instincts the odour of all that wretchedness shaken out to the wind in spite of the torment of the darkness he would come to hate the hour for returning to the settlement how nauseous were all these wretches in a heap living at the common bucket there was not one of them with whom he could seriously talk politics it was a bestial existence always the same air tainted by onion in which one choked he wished to enlarge their horizon to raise them to the comfort and good manners of the middle class by making them masters but how long it would take and he no longer felt the courage to await victory in this prison of hunger by slow degrees his vanity of leadership his constant preoccupation of thinking in their place left him free breathing into him the soul of one of those bourgeois whom he execrated jeanlin one evening brought a candle end stolen from a carter's lantern and this was a great relief for etienne when the darkness began to stupefy him weighing on his skull almost to madness he would light up for a moment then as soon as he had chased away the nightmare he extinguished the candle miserly of this brightness which was as necessary to his life as bread the silence buzzed in his ears he only heard the flight of a band of rats the cracking of the old timber the tiny sound of a spider weaving her web and with eyes open in this warm nothingness he returned to his fixed idea the thought of what his mates were doing above desertion on his part would have seemed to him the worst cowardice if he thus hid himself it was to remain free to give counsel or to act his long meditations had fixed his ambition while awaiting something better he would like to be clochard leaving manual work in order to work only at politics but alone in a clean room under the pretext that brain labor absorbs the entire life and needs quiet at the beginning of the second week the child having told him that the police supposed he had gone over to belgium etienne ventured out of his hole at nightfall he wished to ascertain the situation and to decide if it was still well to persist he himself considered the game doubtful before the strike he felt uncertain of the result and had simply yielded to facts and now after having been intoxicated with rebellion he came back to this first doubt despairing of making the company yield but he would not yet confess this to himself he was tortured when he thought of the miseries of defeat and the heavy responsibility of suffering which would weigh upon him the end of the strike was it not the end of his part the overthrow of his ambition his life falling back into the brutishness of the mine and the horrors of the settlement and honestly without any base calculation or falsehood he endeavoured to find his faith again to prove to himself that resistance was still possible that capital was about to destroy itself in face of the heroic suicide of labour throughout the entire country in fact there was nothing but a long echo of ruin at night when he wandered through the black country like a wolf who has come out of his forest he seemed to hear the crash of bankruptcies from one end of the plain to the other he now passed by the roadside nothing but closed dead workshops becoming rotten beneath the dull sky the sugar works had especially suffered the Houghton sugar works the fauvel works after having reduced the number of their hands had come to grief one after the other at the Dutile flower works the last mill had stopped on the second saturday of the month and the blues rope works for mine cables had been quite ruined by the strike on the marchand side the situation was growing worse every day all the fires were out at the gagebois glassworks men were continually being sent away from the sonville workshops only one of the three glass furnaces of the forges was alight and not one battery of coke ovens was burning on the horizon the strike of the montsou colliers born of the industrial crisis which had been growing worse for two years and increased it and precipitated the downfall to the other causes of suffering the stoppage of orders from america and the engorgement of invested capital in excessive production was now added the unforeseen lack of coal for the few furnaces which were still kept up 
and that was the supreme agony this engine bread which the pits no longer furnished frightened by the general anxiety the company by diminishing its output and starving its miners inevitably found itself at the end of december without a fragment of coal at the surface of its pits everything held together the plague blew from afar one fall led to another the industries tumbled each other over as they fell in so rapid a series of catastrophes that the shocks echoed in the midst of the neighboring cities lille douai valenciennes where absconding bankers were bringing ruin on whole families at the turn of a road etienne often stopped in the frozen night to hear the rubbish raining down he breathed deeply in the darkness the joy of annihilation seized him the hope that day would dawn on the extermination of the old world with not a single fortune left standing the scythe of equality levelling everything to the ground but in this massacre it was the company's pits that especially interested him he would continue his walk blinded by the darkness visiting them one after the other glad to discover some new disaster landslips of increasing gravity continued to occur on account of the prolonged abandonment of passages above the north gallery of miro the ground sank in to such an extent that the Roiselle road for the distance of a hundred metres had been swallowed up as though by the shock of an earthquake and the company disturbed at the rumours raised by these accidents paid the owners for their vanished fields without bargaining Crecourt and madeleine which lay in very shifting rock were becoming stopped up more and more it was said that two captains had been buried at the victoire there was an inundation at boutre cantel it had been necessary to wall up a gallery for the length of a kilometre at st thomas where the ill-kept timbering was breaking down everywhere thus every hour enormous sums were spent making great breaches in the shareholders dividends a rapid destruction of the pits was going on which must end at last by eating up the famous Monceau deniers which had been centupled in a century in the face of these repeated blows hope was again born in etienne he came to believe that a third month of resistance would crush the monster the wary sated beast crouching down there like an idol in his unknown tabernacle he knew that after the Molson troubles there had been great excitement in the paris journals quite a violent controversy between the official newspapers and the opposition newspapers terrible narratives which were especially directed against the international of which the empire was becoming afraid after having first encouraged it and the directors not daring to turn a deaf ear any longer two of them had condescended to come and hold an inquiry but with an air of regret not appearing to care about the upshot so disinterested that in three days they went away again declaring that everything was going on as well as possible he was told however from other quarters that during their stay these gentlemen sat permanently displaying feverish activity and absorbed in transactions of which no one about them uttered a word and he charged them with affecting confidence they did not feel and came to look upon their departure as a nervous flight feeling now certain of triumph since these terrible men were letting everything go but on the following night etienne despaired again the company's back was too robust to be so easily broken they might lose millions but later on they would get them back again by gnawing at their men's bread on that night having pushed as far as jean bart he guessed the truth when an overseer told him that there was talk of yielding van damme to monceau at delin's house it was said the wretchedness was pitiful the wretchedness of the rich the father ill in his powerlessness aged by his anxiety over money the daughters struggling in the midst of tradesmen trying to save their shifts there was less suffering in the famished settlements than in this middle-class house where they shut themselves up to drink water work had not been resumed at jean bart and it had been necessary to replace the pump at gaston marie while in spite of all haste an inundation had already begun which made great expenses necessary Denelin had at last risked his request for a loan of one hundred thousand francs from the gregoires and the refusal 
though he had expected it completed his dejection if they refused it was for his sake in order to save him from an impossible struggle and they advised him to sell he as usual violently refused it enraged him to have to pay the expenses of the strike he hoped at first to die of it with the blood at his head strangled by apoplexy then what was to be done he had listened to the director's offers they wrangled with him they depreciated this superb prey this repaired pit equipped anew where the lack of capital alone paralyzed the output he would be lucky if he got enough out of it to satisfy his creditors for two days he had struggled against the directors at Monceau, furious at the quiet way with which they took advantage of his embarrassment and shouting his refusals at them in his loud voice and there the affair remained and they had returned to paris to await patiently his last groans etienne smelled out this compensation for the disasters and was again seized by discouragement before the invincible power of the great capitalists so strong in battle that they fattened in defeat by eating the corpses of the small capitalists who fell at their side the next day fortunately jeanlin brought him a piece of good news at the Garo, the tubbing of the shaft was threatening to break and the water was filtering in from all the joints in great haste a gang of carpenters had been set on to repair it up to now etienne had avoided the Garot warned by the everlasting black silhouette of the sentinel stationed on the pit-bank above the plain he could not be avoided he dominated in the air like the flag of the regiment towards three o'clock in the morning the sky became overcast and he went to the pit where some mates explained to him the bad condition of the tubbing they even thought it would have to be done entirely over again which would stop the output of coal for three months for a long time he prowled round listening to the carpenter's mallets hammering in the shaft that wound which had to be dressed rejoiced his heart as he went back in the early daylight he saw the sentinel still on the pit bank this time he would certainly be seen as he walked he thought about those soldiers who were taken from the people to be armed against the people how easy the triumph of the revolution would be if the army were suddenly to declare for it it would be enough if the workmen and the peasant in the barracks were to remember their origin that was the supreme peril the great terror which made the teeth of the middle class chatter when they thought of a possible defection of the troops in two hours they would be swept away and exterminated with all the delights and abominations of their iniquitous life it was already said that whole regiments were tainted with socialism was it true when justice came would it be thanks to the cartridges distributed by the middle class and snatching at another hope the young man dreamed that the regiment with its posts now guarding the pits would come over to the side of the strikers shoot down the company to a man and at last give the mine to the miners he then noticed that he was ascending the pit bank his head filled with these reflections why should he not talk with this soldier he would get to know what his ideas were with an air of indifference he continued to come nearer as though he were gleaning old wood among the rubbish the sentinel remained motionless eh mate damned weather said etienne at last i think we shall have snow he was a small soldier very fair with a pale gentle face covered with red freckles he wore his military greatcoat with the awkwardness of a recruit yes perhaps we shall i think he murmured and with his blue eyes he gazed at the livid sky on a smoky dawn with soot weighing like lead afar over the plain what idiots they are to put you here to freeze etienne went on one would think the cossacks were coming and then there's always wind here the little soldier shivered without complaining there was certainly a little cabin of dry stones there where old bonmort used to take shelter when it blew a hurricane but the order being not to leave the summit of the pit bank the soldier did not stir from it his hand so stiffened by cold that he could no longer feel his weapon he belonged to the guard of sixty men who were protecting the barreau and as this cruel sentry duty frequently came round he had before nearly stayed there for good with his dead feet 
his work demanded it a passive obedience finished the benumbing process and he replied to these questions with the stammered words of a sleepy child etienne in vain endeavoured during the quarter of an hour to make him talk about politics he replied yes or no without seeming to understand some of his comrades said that the captain was a republican as to him he had no idea it was all the same to him if he was ordered to fire he would fire so as not to be punished the workmen listened seized with the popular hatred against the army against these brothers whose hearts were changed by sticking a pair of red pantaloons on to their buttocks then what's your name jules and where do you come from from Plogot, over there he stretched out his arm at random it was in brittany he knew no more his small pale face grew animated he began to laugh and felt warmer i have a mother and a sister they are waiting for me sure enough ah it won't be for to-morrow when i left they came with me as far as pont Meabe. we had to take the horse to les Pommets. it nearly broke its legs at the bottom of the Audien hill cousin charles was waiting for us with sausages but the women were crying too much and it stuck in our throats good lord what a long way off our home is his eyes grew moist though he was still laughing the desert moorland of Plogoff, that wild storm-beaten point of the Raz, appeared to him beneath a dazzling sun in the rosy season of heather do you think he asked if i'm not punished that they'll give me a month's leave in two years then at the end talked about provence which he had left when he was quite small the daylight was growing and flakes of snow began to fly earthy sky and at last he felt anxious on noticing jean lin who was prowling about in the midst of the bushes stupefied to see him up there the child was beckoning to him what was the good of this dream of fraternizing with the soldiers it would take years and years in his useless attempt cast him down as though he had expected to succeed but suddenly he understood jeanlin's gesture the sentinel was about to be relieved and he went away running off to bury himself at Requillac, his heart crushed once more by the certainty of defeat while the little scamp who ran beside him was accusing that dirty beast of a trooper of having called out the guard to fire at them on the summit of the pit bank jules stood motionless with eyes vacantly gazing at the falling snow the sergeant was approaching with his men and the regulation cries were exchanged give in advance and give the password and they heard the heavy steps begin again ringing as though on a conquered country in spite of the growing daylight nothing stirred in the settlements the colliers remained in silent rage beneath the military boot End of section thirty Section thirty one of Germanon by Emile Zola Translation by Havelock Ellis This Librivox recording is in the public domain reading by Matt Perard Part six Chapter two Snow had been falling for two days since the morning it had ceased and an intense frost had frozen the immense sheet this black country with its inky roads and walls and trees powdered with coal dust was now white a single whiteness stretching out without end the dusson quaron settlement lay beneath the snow as though it had disappeared no smoke came out of the chimneys the houses without fire and as cold as the stones in the street did not melt the thick layer on the tiles it was nothing more than a quarry of white slabs in the white plain a vision of a dead village wound in its shroud along the roads the passing patrols alone made a muddy mess with their stamping among the mahirs the last shovelful of cinders had been burnt the evening before and it was no use any longer to think of gleaning on the pit bank in this terrible weather when the sparrows themselves could not find a blade of grass alzire from the obstinacy with which her poor hands had dug in the snow was dying mahud had to wrap her up in the fragment of a coverlet while waiting for dr vanderhagen for whom she had twice gone out without being able to find him the servant had however 
promised that he would come to the settlement before night and the mother was standing at the window watching while the little invalid who had wished to be downstairs was shivering on a chair having the illusion that it was better there near the cold grate old bonmort opposite his legs bad once more seemed to be sleeping neither lenore or henri had come back from scouring the roads in company with john lynn to ask for sue maheu alone was walking heavily up and down the bare room stumbling against the wall at every turn with the stupid air of an animal which can no longer see its cage the petroleum also was finished but the reflection of the snow from outside was so bright that it vaguely lit up the room in spite of the deepening night there was a noise of sabots and the levaque woman pushed open the door like a gale of wind beside herself shouting furiously from the threshold at Mehu. that is you who have said that i forced my lodger to give me twenty sous when he sleeps with me the other shrugged her shoulders don't bother me i said nothing and who told you so they tell me you said so it doesn't concern you who it was you even said you could hear us at our dirty tricks behind the wall and that the filth gets into our house because i'm always on my back just tell me you didn't say so eh every day quarrels broke out as a result of the constant gossiping of the women especially between those households which lived door to door squabbles and reconciliations took place every day but never before had such bitterness thrown them one against the other since the strike hunger exasperated their rancor so that they felt the need of blows an altercation between two gossiping women finished by a murderous onset between their two men just then levaque arrived in his turn dragging bouteloup here's our mate let him just say if he has given twenty sous to my wife to sleep with her the lodger hiding his timid gentleness in his great beard protested and stammered oh that no never anything never at once levaque became threatening and thrust his fist beneath maheu's nose you know that won't do for me if a man's got a wife like that he ought to knock her ribs in if not then you believe what she says by god exclaimed maheu furious at being dragged out of his dejection what is all this clatter again haven't we got enough to do with our misery just leave me alone damn you or i'll let you know it and first who says that my wife said so who says so pierron said so maheu broke into a sharp laugh and turning towards the levaque woman ah pierron is it well i can tell you what she told me yes she told me that you sleep with both your men the one underneath and the other on top after that it was no longer possible to come to an understanding they all grew angry and the levaques as a reply to the maheus asserted that perron had said a good many other things on their account that they had sold catherine that they were all rotten together even to the little ones with a dirty disease caught by etienne at the volcan she said that she said that yelled maheu good i'll go to her i will and if she says that she said that she shall feel my hand on her chops he was carried out of himself and the levaques followed him to see what would happen while bouteloup having a horror of disputes furtively returned home excited by the altercation maheude was also going out when a complaint from alzir held her back she crossed the ends of the coverlet over the little one's quivering body and placed herself before the window looking out vaguely and that doctor was still delayed at the perron's door maheu and the levaques met lydie who was stamping in the snow the house was closed and a thread of light came through a crack in a shutter the child replied at first to their questions with constraint no her father was not there he had gone to the wash-house to join mother brule and bring back the bundle of linen then she was confused and would not say what her mother was doing at last she let out everything with a sly spiteful laugh her mother had pushed her out of the door because monsieur dansart was there and she prevented them from talking since the morning he had been going about the settlement with two policemen trying to pick up workmen imposing on the weak and announcing everywhere that if the descent did not take place on monday at the voreux 
the company had decided to hire men from the baronage and as the night came on he sent away the policeman finding perron alone then he had remained with her to drink a glass of gin before a good fire hush hold your tongue we must see them said Labac with a lewd laugh we'll explain everything directly get off with you youngster lydie drew back a few steps while he put his eye to a crack in the shutter he stifled a low cry and his back bent with a quiver in her turn his wife looked through but she said as though taken by the colic that it was disgusting maheu who had pushed her wishing also to see then declared that he had had enough for his money and they began again in a row each taking his glass as at a peep show the parlour glittering with cleanliness was enlivened by a large fire there were cakes on the table with a bottle and glasses in fact quite a feast what they saw going on in there at last exasperated the two men who under other circumstances would have laughed over it for six months that she should let herself be stuffed up to the neck with her skirts in the air was funny but good god was it not disgusting to do that in front of a great fire and to get up one's strength with biscuits when the mates had neither a slice of bread nor a fragment of coal here's father cried lady running away Perron was quietly coming back from the wash-house with a bundle of linen on his shoulder maheu immediately addressed him here they tell me that your wife says that i sold catherine and that we are all rotten at home and what do they pay you in your house your wife and the gentleman who is this minute wearing out her skin the astonished perron could not understand and perron seized with fear on hearing the tumult of voices lost her head and set the door ajar to see what was the matter they could see her looking very red with her dress open and her skirt tucked up at her waist while dansart in the background was wildly buttoning himself up the head captain rushed away and disappeared trembling with fear that the story would reach the manager's ears then there would be an awful scandal laughter and hooting and abuse you who are always saying that other people are dirty shouted the levaque woman to perron it's not surprising that you're clean when you get the bosses to scour you ah it's fine for her to talk said levaque again here's a trollop who says that my wife sleeps with me and the lodger one below and the other above yes yes that's what they tell me you say but piron grown calm held her own against this abuse very contemptuous in the assurance that she was the best-looking and the richest i've said what i've said just leave me alone will you what have my affairs got to do with you a pack of jealous creatures who want to get over us because we are able to save up money get along get along you can say what you like my husband knows well enough why monsieur dansel was here perron in fact was furiously defending his wife the quarrel turned they accused him of having sold himself of being a spy the company's dog they charged him with shutting himself up to gorge himself with the good things with which the bosses paid him for his treachery and defence he pretended that maheu had slipped beneath his door a threatening paper with two crossbones and a dagger above and this necessarily ended in a struggle between the men as the quarrels of the women always did now that famine was enraging the mildest maheu and levaque rushed on perron with their fists and had to be pulled off blood was flowing from her son-in-law's nose when mother brulé in her turn arrived from the wash-house when informed of what had been going on she merely said the damned beast dishonors me the road was becoming deserted not a shadow spotted the naked whiteness of the snow and the settlement falling back into its death-like immobility went on starving beneath the intense cold and the doctor asked maheu as he shut the door not come replied maheu still standing before the window are the little ones back no not back maheu again began his heavy walk from one wall to the other looking like a stricken ox father bonmort sitting stiffly on his chair had not even lifted his head azir also had said nothing and was trying not to shiver so as to avoid giving them pain but in spite of her courage and suffering she sometimes trembled so much 
that one could hear against the coverlet the quivering of the little invalid girl's lean body while with her large open eyes she stared at the ceiling from which the pale reflection of the white gardens lit up the room like moonshine the emptied house was now in its last agony having reached a final stage of nakedness the mattress ticks had followed the wool to the dealers then the sheets had gone the linen everything that could be sold one evening they had sold a handkerchief of the grandfather's for two soups tears fell over each object of the poor household which had to go and the mother was still lamenting that one day she had carried away in her skirt the pink cardboard box her man's old present as one would carry away a child to get rid of it on some doorstep they were bare they had only their skins left to sell so worn out and injured that no one would have given a farthing for them they no longer even took the trouble to search they knew that there was nothing left that they had come to the end of everything that they must not hope even for a candle or a fragment of coal or a potato and they were waiting to die only grieved about the children and revolted by the useless cruelty that gave the little one a disease before starving it at last here he is said Mahid. a black figure passed before the window the door opened but it was not dr vanderhagen they recognized the new cure abbe ranvier who did not seem surprised at coming on this dead house without light without fire without bread he had already been to three neighboring houses going from family to family seeking willing listeners like dansart with his two policemen and at once he exclaimed in his feverish fanatic's voice why were you not at mass on sunday my children you are wrong the church alone can save you now promise me to come next sunday maheu after staring at him went on pacing heavily without a word it was maheu who replied to mass sir what for isn't the good god making fun of us look here what has my little girl there done to him to be shaking with fever hadn't we enough misery that he had to make her ill too just when i can't even give her a cup of warm gruel then the priest stood and talked at length he spoke of the strike this terrible wretchedness this exasperated rancor of famine with the ardor of a missionary who was preaching to savages for the glory of religion he said that the church was with the poor that she would one day cause justice to triumph by calling down the anger of god on the iniquities of the rich and that day would come soon for the rich had taken the place of god and were governing without god in their impious theft of power but if the workers desired their fair division of the goods of the earth they ought at once to put themselves in the hands of the priests just as on the death of jesus the poor and the humble grouped themselves around the apostles what strength the pope would have what an army the clergy would have under them when they were able to command the numberless crowd of workers in one week they would purge the world of the wicked they would chase away the unworthy masters then indeed there would be a real kingdom of god every one recompensed according to his merits and the law of labor as the foundation for universal happiness Mehid, who was listening to him seemed to hear at the end in those autumn evenings when he announced to them the end of their evils only she had always distrusted the cloth that's very well what you say there sir she replied but that's because you no longer agree with the bourgeois all our other cures dined at the manager's and threatened us with the devil as soon as we asked for bread he began again and spoke of the deplorable misunderstanding between the church and the people now in veiled phrases he hit at the town cures at the bishops at the highly placed clergy sated with enjoyment gorged with domination making pacts with the liberal middle class in the imbecility of their blindness not seeing that it was this middle class which had dispossessed them of the empire of the world deliverance would come from the country priests who would all rise to re-establish the kingdom of christ with the help of the poor and already he seemed to be at their head he raised his bony form like the chief of a band a revolutionary of the gospel his eyes so filled with light that they illuminated the gloomy room 
this enthusiastic sermon lifted him to mystic heights and the poor people had long ceased to understand him no need for so many words growled maheu suddenly you'd best begin by bringing us a loaf come on sunday to mass cried the priest god will provide for everything and he went off to catechize the lavaques in their turn so carried away by his dream of the final triumph of the church and so contemptuous of facts that he would thus go through the settlements without charities with empty hands amid this army dying of hunger being a poor devil himself who looked upon suffering as the spur to salvation maheu continued his pacing and nothing was heard but his regular tramp which made the floor tremble there was the sound of a rust-eaten pulley old von mort was spitting into the cold grate then the rhythm of the feet began again azir weakened by fear was rambling in a low voice laughing thinking that it was warm and that she was playing in the sun good gracious muttered maheude after having touched her cheeks how she burns i don't expect that damn beast now the brigands must have stopped him from coming she meant the doctor and the company she uttered a joyous exclamation however when the door once more opened but her arms fell back and she remained standing still with gloomy face good evening whispered etienne when he had carefully closed the door he often came thus at night-time the mahus learnt his retreat after the second day but they kept the secret and no one in the settlement knew exactly what had become of the young man a legend had grown up around him people still believed in him and mysterious rumours circulated he would reappear with an army and chests full of gold and there was always the religious expectation of a miracle the realized ideal a sudden entry into that city of justice which he had promised them some said that they had seen him lying back in a carriage with three other gentlemen on the marchand's road others affirmed that he was in england for a few days at length however suspicions began to arise and jokers accused him of hiding in a cellar where moquette kept him warm for this relationship when known had done him harm there was a growing disaffection in the midst of his popularity a gradual increase of the despairing among the faithful and their number was certain little by little to grow what brutal weather he added and you nothing new always from bad to worse they tell me that little negrel has been to belgium to get the reins good god we are done for if that is true he shuddered as he entered this dark icy room where it was some time before his eyes were able to see the unfortunate people whose presence he guessed by the deepening of the shade he was experiencing the repugnance and discomfort of the workman who has risen above his class refined by study and stimulated by ambition what wretchedness and odours and the bodies in a heap and a terrible pity caught him by the throat the spectacle of this agony so overcame him that he tried to find words to advise submission but maheu came violently up to him shouting barains they won't dare the bloody fools let the barains go down then if they want us to destroy the pits with an air of constraint etienne explained that it was not possible to move that the soldiers who guarded the pits would protect the descent of the belgian workmen and maheu clenched his fists irritated especially as he said by having bayonets in his back then the colliers were no longer masters in their own place they were treated then like convicts forced to work by a loaded musket he loved his pit it was a great grief to him not to have been down for two months he was driven wild therefore at the idea of this insult these strangers whom they threatened to introduce then the recollection that his certificate had been given back to him struck him to the heart i don't know why i'm angry he muttered i don't belong to their shop any longer when they have hunted me away from here i may as well die on the road as to that said etienne if you like they'll take your certificate back to-morrow people don't send away good workmen he interrupted himself surprised to hear alzire who was laughing softly in the delirium of her fever so far he had only made out father bonnemont's stiff shadow and this gaiety of the sick child frightened him it was indeed too much if the little ones were going to die of it with trembling voice he made up his mind look here this can't go on 
we are done for we must give it up maheude who had been motionless and silent up to now suddenly broke out and treating him familiarly and swearing like a man she shouted in his face what's that you say it's you who say that by god he was about to give reasons but she would not let him speak don't repeat that by god or woman as i am i'll put my fist into your face then we have been dying for two months and i have sold my household and my little ones have fallen ill of it and there is to be nothing done and the injustice is to begin again ah do you know when i think of that my blood stands still no no i would burn everything i would kill everything rather than give up she pointed at maheu in the darkness with a vague threatening gesture listen to this if any man goes back to the pit he'll find me waiting for him on the road to spit in his face and cry coward etienne could not see her but he felt a heat like the breath of a barking animal he had drawn back astonished at this fury which was his work she was so changed that he could no longer recognize the woman who was once so sensible reproving his violent schemes saying that we ought not to wish any one dead and who was now refusing to listen to reason and talking of killing people it was not he now it was she who talked politics who dreamed of sweeping away the bourgeois at a stroke who demanded the republic and the guillotine to free the earth of these rich robbers who fattened on the labor of starvelings yes i could flay them with my fingers we've had enough of them our turn has come now you used to say so yourself when i think of the father the grandfather the grandfather's father what all of them who went before have suffered what we are suffering and that our sons and our sons sons will suffer it over again it makes me mad i could take a knife the other day we didn't do enough at monceau we ought to have pulled the bloody place to the ground down to the last brick and do you know i've only one regret that we didn't let the old man strangle the peeling girl hunger may strangle my little ones for all they care her words fell like the blows of an axe in the night the closed horizon would not open and the impossible ideal was turning to poison in the depths of the skull which had been crushed by grief you have misunderstood etienne was able to say at last beating a retreat we ought to come to an understanding with the company i know that the pits are suffering much so that it would probably consent to an arrangement no never she shouted just then lenore and henri came back with their hands empty a gentleman had certainly given them two sous but the girl kept kicking her little brother and the two sous fell into the snow and as jeanlin had joined in the search they had not been able to find them where is jeanlin he's gone away mother he said he had business etienne was listening with an aching heart once she had threatened to kill them if they ever held out their hands to beg now she sent them herself on to the roads and proposed that all of them the ten thousand colliers of monceau should take stick and wallet like beggars of old and scour the terrified country the anguish continued to increase in the black room the little urchins came back hungry they wanted to eat why could they not have something to eat and they crumbled flung themselves about and at last trod on the feet of their dying sister groaned the mother furiously boxed their ears in the darkness at random then as they cried still louder asking for bread she burst into tears and dropped on to the floor seizing them in one embrace with the little invalid then for a long time her tears fell in a nervous outbreak which left her limp and worn out stammering over and over again the same phrase calling for death oh god why do you not take us oh god in pity take us to have done with it the grandfather preserved his immobility like an old tree twisted by the rain and wind while the father continued walking between the fireplace and the cupboard without turning his head but the door opened and this time it was dr van der hagen the devil he said this light won't spoil your eyes look sharp i'm in a hurry as usual he scolded knocked up by work 
fortunately he had matches with him and the father had to strike six one by one and to hold them while he examined the invalid unwound from her coverlet she shivered beneath this flickering light as lean as a bird dying in the snow so small that one only saw her hump but she smiled with the wandering smile of the dying and her eyes were very large while her poor hands contracted over her hollow breast and as the half-choked mother asked if it was right to take away from her the only child who helped in the household so intelligent and gentle the doctor grew vexed ah she is going dead of hunger your blessed child and not the only one either i've just seen another one over there you all send for me but i can't do anything it's meat that you want to cure you Mayhew, with burnt fingers had dropped the match and the darkness closed over the little corpse which was still warm the doctor had gone away in a hurry etienne heard nothing more in the black room but Mahu's sobs repeating her cry for death that melancholy and endless lamentation oh god it is my turn take me oh god take my man take the others out of pity to have done with it End of section thirty one Section thirty two of Germinal by Emile Zola Translation by Havelock Ellis This LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by Matt Perard. Part six Chapter three On that Sunday ever since eight o'clock souverain had been sitting alone in the parlor of the advantage at his accustomed place with his head against the wall not a single collier knew where to get two sous for a drink and never had the bars had fewer customers so madame rasseneur motionless at the counter preserved an irritated silence while rasseneur standing before the iron fireplace seemed to be gazing with a reflective air at the brown smoke from the coal suddenly in this heavy silence of an overheated room three light quick blows struck against one of the window panes made souverain turn his head he rose for he recognized the signal which etienne had already used several times before in order to call him when he saw him from without smoking his cigarette at an empty table but before the engine man could reach the door rasseneur had opened it and recognizing the man who stood there in the light from the window he said to him are you afraid that i shall sell you you can talk better here than on the road etienne entered madame rasseneur politely offered him a glass which he refused with a gesture the innkeeper added i guessed long ago where you hide yourself if i was a spy as your friends say i should have sent the police after you a week ago there is no need for you to defend yourself replied the young man i know that you have never eaten that sort of bread people may have different ideas and esteem each other all the same and there was silence once more souverain had gone back to his chair with his back to the wall and his eyes fixed on the smoke from his cigarette but his feverish fingers were moving restlessly and he ran them over his knees seeking the warm fur of poland who was absent this evening it was an unconscious discomfort something that was lacking he could not exactly say what seated on the other side of the table etienne at last said to-morrow work begins again at the bureau the belgians have come with little Negrel. yes they landed them at nightfall muttered rasseneur who remained standing as long as they don't kill each other after all then raising his voice no you know i don't want to begin our disputes over again but this will end badly if you hold out any longer why your story is just like that of your international i met Pluchart the day before yesterday at lille where i went on business it's going wrong that machine of his he gave details the association after having conquered the workers of the whole world in an outburst of propaganda which had left the middle class still shuddering was now being devoured and slowly destroyed by an internal struggle between vanities and ambitions since the anarchist had triumphed in it chasing out the earlier evolutionists everything was breaking up 
the original aim the reform of the wage system was lost in the midst of the squabbling of sex the scientific framework was disorganized by the hatred of discipline and already it was possible to foresee the final miscarriage of this general revolt which for a moment had threatened to carry away in a breath the old rotten society Luchart is ill over it Rusner went on and he has no voice at all now all the same he talks on in spite of everything and wants to go to paris and he told me three times over that our strike was done for etienne with his eyes on the ground let him talk on without interruption the evening before he had chatted with some mates and he felt that breaths of spite and suspicion were passing over him those first breaths of unpopularity which forerun defeat and he remained gloomy he would not confess dejection in the presence of a man who had foretold to him that the crowd would hoot him in his turn on the day when they had to avenge themselves for a miscalculation no doubt the strike is done for i know that as well as Pluchart, he said but we foresaw that we accepted this strike against our wishes we didn't count on finishing up with the company only one gets carried away and one begins to expect things and when it turns out badly one forgets that one ought to have expected that instead of lamenting and quarrelling as if it were a catastrophe tumbled down from heaven then if you think the game's lost asked frostner why don't you make the mates listen to reason the young man looked at him fixedly listen enough of this you have your ideas i have mine i came in here to show you that i feel esteem for you in spite of everything but i still think that if we come to grief over this trouble our starved carcasses will do more for the people's cause than all your common-sense politics ah if one of those bloody soldiers would just put a bullet in my heart that would be a fine way of ending his eyes were moist as in this cry there broke out the secret desire of the vanquished the refuge in which he desired to lose his torment for ever well said declared madame rasseneur casting on her husband a look which was full of all the contempt of her radical opinions souverain with a vague gaze feeling about with his nervous hands did not appear to hear his fair girlish face with the thin nose and small pointed teeth seemed to be grown savage in some mystic dream full of bloody visions and he began to dream aloud replying to a remark of rasseneur's about the international which had been let fall in the course of the conversation they are all cowards there is only one man who can make their machine into a terrible instrument of destruction it requires will and none of them have will and that's why the revolution will miscarry once more he went on in a voice of disgust lamenting the imbecility of men while the other two were disturbed by these somnambulistic confidences made in the darkness in russia there was nothing going on well and he was in despair over the news he had received his old companions were all turning to the politicians the famous nihilists who made europe tremble sons of village priests of the lower middle class of tradesmen could not rise above the idea of national liberation and seemed to believe that the world would be delivered when they had killed their despot as soon as he spoke to them of raising society to the ground like a ripe harvest as soon as he even pronounced the infantile word republic he felt that he was misunderstood and a disturber henceforth unclassed and rolled among the lost leaders of cosmopolitan revolution his patriotic heart struggled however and it was with painful bitterness that he repeated his favorite expression foolery they'll never get out of it with their foolery then lowering his voice still more in a few bitter words he described his old dream of fraternity he had renounced his rank and his fortune he had gone among workmen only in the hope of seeing at last the foundation of a new society of labor in common all the sous in his pockets had long gone to the urchins of the settlement he had been as tender as a brother with the colliers smiling at their suspicion winning them over by his quiet workman like ways and his dislike of chattering but decidedly the fusion had not taken place he remained a stranger with his contempt of all bonds 
his desire to keep himself free of all petty vanities and enjoyments and since this morning he had been especially exasperated by reading an incident in the newspapers his voice changed his eyes grew bright he fixed them on etienne directly addressing him now do you understand that these hat workers at marseilles who have won the great lottery prize of a hundred thousand francs have gone off at once and invested it declaring that they are going to live without doing anything yes that is your idea all of you french workmen you want to unearth a treasure in order to devour it alone afterwards in some lazy selfish corner you may cry out as much as you like against the rich you haven't got courage enough to give back to the poor the money that luck brings you you will never be worthy of happiness as long as you own anything and your hatred of the bourgeois proceeds solely from an angry desire to be bourgeois yourselves in their place rasseneur burst out laughing the idea that the two marseilles workmen ought to renounce the big prize seemed to him absurd but souverain grew pale his face changed and became terrible in one of those religious rages which exterminate nations he cried you will all be mown down overthrown cast on the dung heap someone will be born who will annihilate your race of cowards and pleasure seekers and look here you see my hands if my hands were able they would take up the earth like that and shake it until it was smashed to fragments and you were all buried beneath the rubbish well said declared madame rasseneur with her polite and convinced air there was silence again then etienne spoke once more of the borimage men he questioned souverain concerning the steps that had been taken at the Voreux, but the engine man was still preoccupied and scarcely replied he only knew that cartridges would be distributed to the soldiers who were guarding the pit and the nervous restlessness of his fingers over his knees increased to such an extent that at last he became conscious of what was lacking the soft and soothing fur of the tame rabbit where is poland then he asked the innkeeper laughed again as he looked at his wife after an awkward silence he made up his mind poland she is in the pot since her adventure with jeanlin the pregnant rabbit no doubt wounded had only brought forth dead young ones and to avoid feeding a useless mouth they had resigned themselves that very day to serve her up with potatoes yes you ate one of her legs this evening eh you licked your fingers after it souverain had not understood at first then he became very pale and his face contracted with nausea while in spite of his stoicism two large tears were swelling beneath his eyelids but no one had time to notice this emotion for the door had opened roughly and chaval had appeared pushing catherine before him after having made himself drunk with beer and bluster in all the public houses of monceau the idea had occurred to him to go to the advantage to show his old friends that he was not afraid as he came in he said to his mistress by god i tell you you shall drink a glass in here i'll break the jaws of the first man who looks askance at me catherine moved at the sight of etienne had become very pale when chaval in his turn perceived him he grinned in his evil fashion two glasses madame rasseneur we are wetting the new start of work without a word she poured out as a woman who never refused her beer to anyone there was silence and neither the landlord nor the two others stirred from their places i know people who said that i was a spy chaval went on swaggeringly and i'm waiting for them just to say it again to my face so that we can have a bit of explanation no one replied and the men turned their heads and gazed vaguely at the walls there are some who sham and there are some who don't sham he went on louder i've nothing to hide i've left denelin's dirty shop and tomorrow i'm going down to the bureau with a dozen belgians who have been given me to lead because i'm held in esteem and if anyone doesn't like that he can just say so and we'll talk it over then at the same contemptuous silence greeted his provocations he turned furiously on catherine will you drink by god drink with me to the confusion of all the dirty beasts who refuse to work she drank but with so trembling a hand 
that the two glasses struck together with a tinkling sound he had now pulled out of his pocket a handful of silver which he exhibited with drunken ostentation saying that he had earned that with his sweat and that he defied the shammers to show ten sous the attitude of his mates exasperated him and he began to come to direct insults then it is at night that the moles come out the police have to go to sleep before we meet the brigands etienne had risen very calm and resolute listen you annoy me yes you are a spy your money still stinks of some treachery you sold yourself and it disgusts me to touch your skin no matter i'm your man it is quite time that one of us did for the other chaval clenched his fists come along then cowardly dog i must call you so to warm you up you all alone i'm quite willing and you shall pay for all the bloody tricks that have been played on me with suppliant arms catherine advanced between them but they had no need to repel her she felt the necessity of the battle and slowly drew back of her own accord standing against the wall she remained silent so paralyzed with anguish that she no longer shivered her large eyes gazing at these two men who were going to kill each other over her madame rasseneur simply removed the glasses from the counter for fear that they might be broken then she sat down again on the bench without showing any improper curiosity but two old mates could not be left to murder each other like this rasseneur persisted in interfering and souverain had to take him by the shoulder and lead him back to the table saying it doesn't concern you there is one of them too many and the strongest must live without waiting for the attack chaval's fists were already dealing blows at space he was the taller of the two and his blows swung about aiming at the face with furious cutting movements of both arms one after the other as though he were handling a couple of sabres and he went on talking plain to the gallery with volleys of abuse which served to excite him ah you damned devil i'll have your nose i'll do for your bloody nose just let me get at your chops you whore's looking lass i'll make a hash for the bloody swine and then we shall see if the strumpets will run after you in silence and with clenched teeth etienne gathered up his small figure according to the rules of the game protecting his chest and face by both fists and he watched and let them fly like springs released with terrible straight blows at first they did each other little damage the whirling and blustering blows of the one the cool watchfulness of the other prolonged the struggle a chair was overthrown their heavy boots crushed the white sand scattered on the floor but at last they were out of breath their panting respiration was heard while their faces became red and swollen as from an interior fire which flamed out from the clear holes of their eyes played yelled chaval trumps on your carcass in fact his fist working like a flail had struck his adversary's shoulder at the end restrained a groan of pain and the only sound that was heard was the dull bruising of the muscles at the end replied with a straight blow to chaval's chest which would have knocked him out had he had not saved himself by one of his constant goat-like leaps the blow however caught him on the left flank with such effect that he tottered momentarily winded he became furious on feeling his arm grow limp with pain and kicked out like a wild beast aiming at his adversary's belly with his heel have at your guts he stammered in a choked voice i'll pull them out and unwind them for you etienne avoided the blow so indignant at this infraction of the laws of fair fighting that he broke silence hold your tongue brute and no feet by god or i take a chair and bash you with it then the struggle being serious rasseneur was disgusted and would again have interfered but a severe look from his wife held him back had not two customers a right to settle an affair in the house he simply placed himself before the fireplace for fear lest they should tumble over into it souverain in his quiet way had rolled a cigarette but he forgot to light it catherine was motionless against the wall only her hands had unconsciously risen to her waist and with constant fidgeting movements were twisting and tearing at the stuff of her dress she was striving as hard as possible not to cry out and so perhaps kill one of them by declaring her preference 
but she was too so distracted that she did not even know which she preferred chaval who was bathed in sweat and striking at random soon became exhausted in spite of his anger etienne continued to cover himself parrying nearly all the blows a few of which grazed him his ear was split a fingernail had torn away a piece of his neck and this so smarted that he swore in his turn as he drove out one of his terrible straight blows once more chaval saved his chest by a leap but he had lowered himself and the fist reached his face smashing his nose and crushing one eye immediately a jet of blood came from his nostrils and his eye became swollen and bluish blinded by this red flood and dazed by the shock to his skull the wretch was beating the air with his arms at random when another blow striking him at last full in the chest finished him there was a crunching sound he fell on his back with a heavy thud as when a sack of plaster is emptied etienne waited get up if you want some more we'll begin again without replying chaval after a few minutes of stupefaction moved on the ground and stretched his limbs he picked himself up with difficulty resting for a moment curled up on his knees doing something with his hand in the bottom of his pocket which could not be observed then when he was up he rushed forward again his throat swelling with a savage yell but catherine had seen and in spite of herself a loud cry came from her heart astonishing her like the avowal of a preference she had herself been ignorant of take care he's got his knife etienne had only time to parry the first blow with his arm his woolen jacket was cut by the thick blade one of those blades fastened by a copper ferrule into a boxwood handle he had already seized chaval's wrist and a terrible struggle began for he felt that he would be lost if he let go while the other shook his arm in the effort to free it and strike the weapon was gradually lowered as their stiffened limbs grew fatigued etienne twice felt the cold sensation of steel against his skin and he had to make a supreme effort so crushing the other's wrist that the knife slipped from his hand both of them had fallen to the earth and it was etienne who snatched it up brandishing it in his turn he held chaval down beneath his knee and threatened to slit his throat open ah traitor by god you've got it coming to you now he felt an awful voice within deafening him it arose from his bowels and was beating in his head like a hammer a sudden mania of murder a need to taste blood never before had the crisis so shaken him he was not drunk however and he struggled against the hereditary disease with the despairing shudder of a man who is mad with lust and struggles on the verge of rape at last he conquered himself he threw the knife behind him stammering in a hoarse voice get up off you go this time rasseneur had rushed forward but without quite daring to venture between them for fear of catching a nasty blow he did not want any one to be murdered in his house and was so angry that his wife sitting erect at the counter remarked to him that he always cried out too soon souverain who had nearly caught the knife in his legs decided to light his cigarette was it then all over catherine was looking on stupidly at the two men who were unexpectedly both living off you go repeated at the end off you go or i'll do for you chaval arose and with the back of his hand wiped away the blood which continued to flow from his nose with jaw smeared red and bruised eye he went away trailing his feet furious at his defeat catherine mechanically followed him then he turned round and his hatred broke out in a flood of filth no no since you want him sleep with him dirty jade and don't put your bloody feet in my place again if you value your skin he violently banged the door there was deep silence in the warm room the low crackling of the coal was alone heard on the ground there only remained the overturned chair and a rain of blood which the sand on the floor was drinking up End of section thirty two Section thirty three of Germanov by Emil Zola. Translation by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Berard. Part six. Chapter four. 
When they came out of Rasseneur's, Etienne and Catherine walked on in silence. The thaw was beginning, a slow, cold thaw, which stained the snow without melting it. In the livid sky, a full moon could be faintly seen behind great clouds, black rags driven furiously by a tempestuous wind far above and on the earth no breath was stirring nothing could be heard but drippings from the roofs the falling of white lumps with a soft thud etienne was embarrassed by this woman who had been given to him and in his disquiet he could find nothing to say the idea of taking her with him to hide at Recrelard seemed absurd he had proposed to lead her back to the settlement to her parents house but she had refused in terror no no anything rather than be a burden on them once more after having behaved so badly to them and neither of them spoke any more they tramped on at random through the roads which were becoming rivers of mud at first they went down toward the Voreux. then they turned to the right and passed between the pit bank and the canal but you'll have to sleep somewhere he said at last now if i only had a room i could easily take you but a curious spasm of timidity interrupted him the past came back to him their old longings for each other and the delicacies and the shames which had prevented them from coming together did he still desire her that he felt so troubled gradually warmed at the heart by a fresh longing the recollection of the blows she had dealt him at gaston marie now attracted him instead of filling him with spite and he was surprised the idea of taking her to Recuillard was becoming quite natural and easy to execute now come decide where would you like me to take you you must hate me very much to refuse to come with me she was following him slowly delayed by the painful slipping of her sabots into the ruts and without raising her head she murmured i have enough trouble good god don't give me any more what good would it do us what you ask now that i have a lover and you have a woman yourself she meant moquette she believed that he still went with this girl as the rumour ran for the last fortnight and when he swore to her that it was not so she shook her head for she remembered the evening when she had seen them eagerly kissing each other isn't it a pity all this nonsense he whispered stopping we might understand each other so well she shuddered slightly and replied never mind you've nothing to be sorry for you don't lose much if you knew what a trumpery thing i am no bigger than two hapworth of butter so ill made that i shall never become a woman sure enough and she went on freely accusing herself as though the long delay of her puberty had been her own fault in spite of the man whom she had had this lessened her placed her among the urchins one has some excuse at any rate when one can produce a child my poor little one said etienne with deep pity and a very low voice they were at the foot of the pit bank hidden in the shadow of the enormous pile an inky cloud was just then passing over the moon they could no longer even distinguish their faces their breaths were mingled their lips were seeking each other for that kiss which had tormented them with desire for months but suddenly the moon reappeared and they saw the sentinel above them at the top of the rocks white with light standing out erect on the Voreux, and before they had kissed an emotion of modesty separated them that old modesty in which there was something of anger of vague repugnance and much friendship they set out again heavily up to their ankles in mud then it's settled you don't want to have anything to do with me asked etienne no she said you after cheval and after you another eh no that disgusts me it doesn't give me any pleasure what's the use of doing it they were silent and walked some hundred paces without exchanging a word but anyhow do you know where to go to he said again i can't leave you out in a night like this 
she replied simply i'm going back chaval is my man i have nowhere else to sleep but with him but he will beat you to death there was silence again she had shrugged her shoulders in resignation he would beat her and when he was tired of beating her he would stop was not that better than to roam the streets like a vagabond then she was used to blows she said to console herself that eight out of ten girls were no better off than she was if her lover married her some day it would all the same be very nice of him etienne and catherine were moving mechanically towards montsou and as they came near their silences grew longer it was as though they had never before been together he could find no argument to convince her in spite of the deep vexation which he felt at seeing her go back to cheval his heart was breaking he had nothing better to offer than an existence of wretchedness and flight a night with no to-morrow should a soldier's bullet go through his head perhaps after all it was wiser to suffer what he was suffering rather than risk a fresh suffering so he led her back to her lovers with sunken head and made no protest when she stopped him on the main road at the corner of the yards twenty metres from the estaminet piquette saying don't come any farther if he sees you it will only make things worse eleven o'clock struck at the church the estaminet was closed but gleams came through the cracks good-bye she murmured she had given him her hand he kept it and she had to draw it away painfully with a slow effort to leave him without turning her head she went in through the little latched door but he did not turn away standing at the same place with his eyes on the house anxious as to what was passing within he listened trembling lest he should hear the cries of a beaten woman the house remained black and silent he only saw a light appear at a first-floor window and as this window opened and he recognized the thin shadow that was leaning over the road he came near catherine then whispered very low he's not come back i'm going to bed please go away etienne went off the thaw was increasing a regular shower was falling from the roofs a moist sweat flowed down the walls the palings the whole confused mass of this industrial district lost in night at first he turned towards Requillard, sick with fatigue and sadness having no other desire except to disappear under the earth and to be annihilated there then the idea of the Voreux occurred to him again he thought of the belgian workmen who were going down of his mates at the settlement exasperated against the soldiers and resolved not to tolerate strangers in their pit and he passed again along the canal through the puddles of melted snow as he stood once more near the pit bank the moon was shining brightly he raised his eyes and gazed at the sky the clouds were galloping by whipped on by the strong wind which was blowing up there but they were growing white and ravelling out thinly with the misty transparency of troubled water over the moon's face they succeeded each other so rapidly that the moon veiled at moments constantly reappeared in limpid clearness with gaze full of his pure brightness etienne was lowering his head when a spectacle on the summit of the pit bank attracted his attention the sentinel stiffened by cold was walking up and down taking twenty-five paces towards marchiennes and then returning towards monceau the white glitter of his bayonet could be seen above his black silhouette which stood out clearly against the pale sky but what interested the young man behind the cabin where bonnemort used to take shelter on tempestuous nights was a moving shadow a crouching beast in ambush which he immediately recognized as jean Lin with his long flexible spine like a morton's the sentinel could not see him that brigand of a child was certainly preparing some practical joke for he was still furious against the soldiers and asking when they were going to be free from these murderers who had been sent here with guns to kill people for a moment etienne thought of calling him to prevent the execution of some stupid trick 
the moon was hidden he had seen him draw himself up ready to spring but the moon reappeared and the child remained crouching at every turn the sentinel came as far as the cabin then turned his back and walked in the opposite direction and suddenly as a cloud threw its shadow jeanlin leapt on to the soldier's shoulders with the great bound of a wild cat and gripping him with his claws buried his large open knife in his throat the horsehair collar resisted he had to apply both hands to the handle and hang on with all the weight of his body he had often bled fowls which he had found behind farms it was so rapid that there was only a stifled cry in the night while the musket fell with the sound of an old iron already the moon was shining again motionless with stupor etienne was still gazing a shout had been choked in his chest above the pit bank was vacant no shadow was any longer visible against the wild flight of clouds he ran up and found jeanlin on all fours before the corpse which was lying back with extended arms beneath the limpid light the red trousers and grey overcoat contrasted harshly with the snow not a drop of blood had flowed the knife was still in the throat up to the handle with a furious unreasoning blow of the fist he knocked the child down beside the body what have you done that for he stammered wildly jeanlin picked himself up and rested on his hands with a feline movement of his thin spine his large ears his green eyes his prominent jaws were quivering and aflame with the shock of his deadly blow by god why have you done this i don't know i wanted to he persisted in this reply for three days he had wanted to it tormented him it made his head ache behind his ears because he thought about it so much need one be so particular with these damned soldiers who were worrying the colliers in their own homes of the violent speeches he had heard in the forest the cries of destruction and death shouted among the pits five or six words had remained with him and these he repeated like a street urchin playing at revolution and he knew no more no one had urged him on it had come to him of itself just as the desire to steal onions from a field came to him startled at this obscure growth of crime in the recesses of this childish brain etienne again pushed him away with a kick like an unconscious animal he trembled lest the guard at the voreux had heard the sentinel's stifled cry and looked towards the pit every time the moon was uncovered but nothing stirred and he bent down felt the hands that were gradually becoming icy and listened to the heart which had stopped beneath the overcoat only the bone handle of the knife could be seen with a motto on it the simple word amour engraved in black letters his eyes went from the throat to the face suddenly he recognized the little soldier it was jules the recruit with whom he had talked one morning and deep pity came over him in front of this fair gentle face marked with freckles the blue eyes wide open were gazing at the sky with that fixed gaze with which he had before seen him searching the horizon for the country of his birth where was it that plug off which had appeared to him beneath the dazzling sun over there over there the sea was moaning afar on this tempestuous night that wind passing above had perhaps swept over the moors two women perhaps were standing there the mother and the sister clutching their wind-blown coifs gazing as if they could see what was now happening to the little fellow through the leagues which separated them they would always wait for him now what an abominable thing it is for poor devils to kill each other for the sake of the rich but this corpse had to be disposed of etienne at first thought of throwing it into the canal but was deterred from this by the certainty that it would be found there his anxiety became extreme every minute was of importance what decision should he take he had a sudden inspiration if he could carry the body as far as Recolard, he would be able to bury it there for ever come here he said to jeanlin the child was suspicious 
no you want to beat me and then i have business good night in fact he had given a rendezvous to bebert and lydie in a hiding place a hole arranged under the wood supply at the Voreux. it had been arranged to sleep out so as to be there if the belgians bones were to be broken by stoning when they went down the pit listen repeated etienne come here or i shall call the soldiers who will cut your head off and as jeanlin was making up his mind he rolled his handkerchief and bound the soldier's neck tightly without drawing out the knife so as to prevent the blood from flowing the snow was melting on the soil there was neither a red patch nor the footmarks of a struggle take the legs jeanlin took the legs while etienne seized the shoulders after having fastened the gun behind his back and then they both slowly descended the pit bank trying to avoid rolling any rocks down fortunately the moon was hidden but as they passed along the canal it reappeared brightly and it was a miracle that the guard did not see them silently they hastened on hindered by the swinging of the corpse and obliged to place it on the ground every hundred metres at the corner of the regular lane they heard a sound which froze them with terror and they only had time to hide behind a wall to avoid a patrol farther on a man came across them but he was drunk and moved away abusing them at last they reached the old pit bathed in perspiration and so exhausted that their teeth were chattering etienne had guessed that it would not be easy to get the soldier down the ladder shaft it was an awful task first of all jeanlin standing above had to let the body slide down while etienne hanging on to the bushes had to accompany it to enable it to pass the first two ladders where the rungs were broken afterwards at every ladder he had to perform the same manoeuvre over again going down first then receiving the body in his arms and he had thus down thirty ladders two hundred and ten metres to feel it constantly falling over him the gun scraped his spine he had not allowed the child to go for the candle-end which he preserved avariciously what was the use the light would only embarrass them in this narrow tube when they arrived at the pit-eye however out of breath he sent the youngster for the candle he then sat down and waited for him in the darkness near the body with heart beating violently as soon as jeanlin reappeared with the light etienne consulted with him for the child had explored these old workings even to the cracks through which men could not pass they set out again dragging the dead body for nearly a kilometre through a maze of ruinous galleries at last the roof became low and they found themselves kneeling beneath a sandy rock supported by half-broken planks it was a sort of long chest in which they laid the little soldier as in a coffin they placed his gun by his side then with vigorous blows of their heels they broke the timber at the risk of being buried themselves immediately the rock gave way and they scarcely had time to crawl back on their elbows and knees when etienne returned seized by the desire to look once more the roof was still falling in slowly crushing the body beneath its enormous weight and then there was nothing more left nothing but the vast mass of the earth jeanlin having returned to his own corner his little cabin of villainy was stretching himself out on the hay overcome by weariness and murmuring hey ho the brats must wait for me i'm going to have an hour's sleep etienne had blown out the candle of which there was only a small end left he also was worn out but he was not sleepy painful nightmare thoughts were beating like hammers in his skull only one at last remained torturing him and fatiguing him with a question to which he could not reply why had he not struck cheval when he held him beneath the knife and why had this child just killed a soldier whose very name he did not know it shook his revolutionary beliefs the courage to kill the right to kill was he then a coward in the hay the child had begun snoring the snoring of a drunken man as if he were sleeping off the intoxication of his murder etienne was disgusted and irritated 
it hurt him to know that the boy was there and to hear him suddenly he started a breath of fear passed over his face a light rustling a sob seemed to him to have come out of the depths of the earth the image of the little soldier lying over there with his gun beneath the rocks froze his back and made his hair stand up it was idiotic the whole mind seemed to be filled with voices he had to light the candle again and only grew calm on seeing the emptiness of the galleries by this pale light for another quarter of an hour he reflected still absorbed in the same struggle his eyes fixed on the burning wick but there was a spluttering the wick was going out and everything fell back into darkness he shuddered again he could have boxed jeanlin's ears to keep him from snoring so loudly the neighbourhood of the child became so unbearable that he escaped tormented by the need for fresh air hastening through the galleries and up the passage as though he could hear a shadow panting at his heels up above in the midst of the ruins of Requillard, etienne was at last able to breathe freely since he dared not kill it was for him to die and this idea of death which had already touched him came again and fixed itself in his head as a last hope to die bravely to die for the revolution that would end everything would settle his account good or bad and prevent him from thinking more if the men attacked the Borains, he would be in the first rank and would have a good chance of getting a bad blow it was with firmer step that he returned to prowl around the Barreau. two o'clock struck and the loud noise of voices was coming from the captain's room where the guards who watched over the pit were posted the disappearance of the sentinel had overcome the guards with surprise they had gone to arouse the captain and after a careful examination of the place they concluded that it must be a case of desertion hiding in the shade etienne recollected this republican captain of whom the little soldier had spoken who knows if he might not be persuaded to pass over to the people's side the troop would raise their rifles and that would be the signal for a massacre of the bourgeois a new dream took possession of him he thought no more of dying but remained for hours with his feet in the mud and a drizzle from the thaw falling on his shoulders filled by the feverish hope that victory was still possible up to five o'clock he watched for the barans then he perceived that the company had cunningly arranged that they should sleep at the Barreau. the descent had begun and the few strikers from the du saint quaron settlement who had been posted as scouts had not yet warned their mates it was he who told them of the trick and they set out running while he waited behind the pit bank on the towing path six o'clock struck and the earthy sky was growing pale and lighting up with a reddish dawn when the abbe rambier came along the path holding up his cassock above his thin legs every monday he went to say an early mass at a convent chapel on the other side of the pit good morning my friend he shouted in a loud voice after staring at the young man with his flaming eyes but at the end did not reply far away between the rural platforms he had just seen a woman pass and he rushed forward anxiously for he thought he recognized catherine since midnight catherine had been walking about the thawing roads chaval on coming back and finding her in bed had knocked her out with a blow he shouted to her to go at once by the door if she did not wish to go by the window and scarcely dressed in tears and bruised by kicks in her legs she had been obliged to go down pushed outside by a final thrust the sudden separation dazed her and she sat down on a stone looking up at the house still expecting that he would call her back it was not possible he would surely look for her and tell her to come back when he saw her thus shivering and abandoned with no one to take her in at the end of two hours she made up her mind dying of cold and as motionless as a dog thrown into the street she left Mosso, then retraced her steps but dared neither to call from the pathway nor to knock at the door at last she went off by the main road to the right with the idea of going to the settlement to a parent's house but when she reached it she was seized by such shame that she rushed away along the gardens 
for fear of being recognized by someone in spite of the heavy sleep which weighed on all eyes behind the closed shutters and after that she wandered about frightened at the slightest noise trembling lest she should be seized and led away as a strumpet to that house at marsh end the threat of which had haunted her like nightmare for months twice she stumbled against the barreau but terrified at the loud voices of the guard she ran away out of breath looking behind her to see if she was being pursued the Requillard lane was always full of drunken men she went back to it however with the vague hope of meeting there him she had repelled a few hours earlier chaval had to go down that morning and this thought brought catherine again towards the pit though she felt that it would be useless to speak to him all was over between them there was no work going on at jean bart and he had sworn to kill her if she worked again at the Voreux, where he feared that she would compromise him so what was to be done to go elsewhere to die of hunger to yield beneath the blows of every man who might pass she dragged herself along tottering amid the ruts with aching legs and mud up to her spine the thaw had now filled the streets with a flood of mire she waded through it still walking not daring to look for a stone to sit on day appeared catherine had just recognized the back of cheval who was cautiously going round the pit-bank when she noticed Lydie and bevere putting their noses out of their hiding-place beneath the wood supply they had passed the night there in ambush without going home since jeanlin's order was to await him and while this latter was sleeping off the drunkenness of his murder at Requillard, the two children were lying in each other's arms to keep warm the wind blew between the planks of chestnut and oak and they rolled themselves up as in some woodcutter's abandoned hut Lydie did not dare to speak aloud the sufferings of the small beaten woman any more than bebert found courage to complain of the captain's blows which made his cheeks swell but the captain was really abusing his power risking their bones in mad marauding expeditions while refusing to share the booty their hearts rose in revolt and they had at last embraced each other in spite of his orders careless of that box of the ears from the invisible with which he had threatened them it never came so they went on kissing each other softly with no idea of anything else putting into that caress the passion they had long struggled against the whole of their martyred and tender natures all night through they had thus kept each other warm so happy at the bottom of the secret hole that they could not remember that they had ever been so happy before not even on st barbara's day when they had eaten fritters and drunk wine the sudden sound of a bugle made catherine start she raised herself and saw the baroque guards taking up their arms etienne arrived running bebert and Lydie jumped out of their hiding-place with a leap and over there beneath the growing daylight a band of men and women were coming from the settlement gesticulating wildly with anger End of section thirty three Section thirty four of Germanon by Emile Zola, translated by Havelock Ellis. The Slippervox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part six, chapter five. All the entrances to the Voreux had been closed, and the sixty soldiers with grounded arms were barring the only door left free, that leading to the receiving room by his narrow staircase into which opened the captain's room and the shed the men had been drawn up in two lines against the brick wall so that they could not be attacked from behind at first the band of miners from the settlement kept at a distance they were some thirty at most and talked together in a violent and confused way mehid who had arrived first with dishevelled hair beneath a handkerchief nodded on in haste and having estelle asleep in her arms repeated in feverish tones don't let any one in or any one out shut them all in there 
maheu approved and just then father mouque arrived with requillard they wanted to prevent him from passing but he protested he said that his horses ate their hay all the same and cared precious little about a revolution besides there was a horse dead and they were waiting for him to draw it up etienne freed the old groom and the soldiers allowed him to go to the shaft a quarter of an hour later as the band of strikers which had gradually enlarged was becoming threatening a large door opened on the ground floor and some men appeared drawing out the dead beast a miserable mass of flesh still fastened in the rope net they left it in the midst of the puddles of melting snow the surprise was so great that no one prevented the men from returning and barricading the door afresh they all recognized the horse with his head bent back and stiff against the plank whispers ran around it's trompette isn't it it's trompette it was in fact trompette since his descent he had never become acclimatized he remained melancholy with no taste for his task as though tortured by regret for the light in vain Bataille, the doyen of the mine would rub him with his ribs in his friendly way softly biting his neck to impart to him a little of the resignation gained in his ten years beneath the earth these caresses increased his melancholy his skin quivered beneath the confidences of the comrade who had grown old in darkness and both of them whenever they met and snorted together seemed to be grieving the old one that he could no longer remember the young one that he could not forget at the stable they were neighbors at the manger and lived with lowered heads breathing in each other's nostrils exchanging a constant dream of daylight visions of green grass of white roads of infinite yellow light then when trompette bathed in sweat lay in agony in his litter Bataille had smelled at him despairingly with short snips like sobs he felt that he was growing cold the mind was taking from him his last joy that friend fallen from above fresh with good odours who recalled to him his youth in the open air and he had broken his tether neighing with fear when he perceived that the other no longer stirred Mok had indeed warned the head captain a week ago but much they troubled about a sick horse at such time as this these gentlemen did not at all like moving the horses now however they had to make up their minds to take him out the evening before the groom had spent an hour with two men tying up trompette they harnessed a tail to bring him to the shaft the old horse slowly pulled dragging his dead comrade through so narrow a gallery that he could only shake himself at the risk of taking the skin off and he tossed his head listening to the grazing sound of the carcass as it went to the knacker's yard at the pit eye when he was unharnessed he followed with his melancholy eye the preparations for the ascent the body pushed on to the crossbars over the sump the net fastened beneath a cage at last the porters rang meat he lifted his neck to see it go up at first softly then at once lost in the darkness flown up forever to the top of that black hole and he remained with neck stretched out his vague beast's memory perhaps recalling the things of the earth but it was all over he would never see his comrade again and he himself would thus be tied up in a pitiful bundle on the day when he would ascend up there his legs began to tremble the fresh air which came from the distant country choked him and he seemed intoxicated when he went heavily back to the stable at the surface the colliers stood gloomily before trompette's carcass a woman said in a low voice another man that may go down if it likes but a new flood arrived from the settlement and levaque who was at the head followed by his wife and bottle shouted kill them those barains no black legs here kill them kill them all rushed forward and etienne had to stop them he went up to the captain a tall thin young man of scarcely twenty-eight years with a despairing resolute face he explained things to him he tried to win him over watching the effect of his words what was the good of risking a useless massacre 
was not justice on the side of the miners they were all brothers and they ought to understand one another when he came to use the word republic the captain made a nervous movement but he preserved his military stiffness and said suddenly keep off do not force me to do my duty three times over etienne tried again behind him his mates were growling the report ran that m rambeau was at the pit and they talked of letting him down by the neck to see if he would hew his coal himself but it was a false report only negrel and ansart were there they both showed themselves for a moment at a window of the receiving room the head captain stood in the background rather out of countenance since his adventure with Piron, while the engineer bravely looked around on the crowd with his bright little eyes smiling with that sneering contempt in which he enveloped men and things generally hooting arose and they disappeared and in their place only souverain's pale face was seen he was just then on duty he had not left his engine for a single day since the strike began no longer talking more and more absorbed by a fixed idea which seemed to be shining like steel in the depths of his pale eyes repeated the captain loudly i wish to hear nothing my orders are to guard the pit and i shall guard it and do not press on to me my men or i shall know how to drive you back in spite of his firm voice he was growing pale with increasing anxiety as the flood of miners continued to swell he would be relieved at midday but fearing that he would not be able to hold out until then he had sent a trammer from the pit to Monceau to ask for reinforcements shouts had replied to him kill the black legs kill the barangs we mean to be masters in our own place etienne drew back in despair the end had come there was nothing more except to fight and to die and he ceased to hold back his mates the mob moved up to the little troop there were nearly four hundred of them and the people from the neighboring settlements were all running up they all shouted the same cry Mahieu and Levaque said furiously to the soldiers, Get off with you. We have nothing against you. Get off with you. This doesn't concern you, said Mahieu. Let us attend to our own affairs. And from behind, the Levaque woman added more violently, Must we eat you to get through? Just clear out of the bloody place. Even Lydie's shrill voice was heard. She had crammed herself in more closely with Bebert and was saying in a high voice, oh the pale-livered pigs catherine a few paces off was gazing and listening stupefied by new scenes of violence into the midst of which ill luck seemed to be always throwing her had she not suffered too much already what fault had she committed then that misfortune would never give her any rest the day before she had understood nothing of the fury of the strike she thought that when one has one share of blows it is useless to go and seek for more and now her heart was swelling with hatred she remembered what etienne had often told her when they used to sit up she tried to hear what he was now saying to the soldiers he was treating them as mates he reminded them that they also belonged to the people and that they ought to be on the side of the people against those who took advantage of their wretchedness but a tremor ran through the crowd and an old woman rushed up it was mother brulé terrible in her leanness with her neck and arms in the air coming up at such a pace that the wisps of her gray hair blinded her ah by god here i am she stammered out of breath that traitor perron who shut me up in the cellar and without waiting she fell on the soldiers her black mouth belching abuse pack of scoundrels dirty scum ready to lick their master's boots and only brave against poor people then the others joined her and there were volleys of insults a few indeed cried hurrah for the soldiers to the shaft with the officer but soon there was only one clamour down with the red breeches these men who had listened quietly with motionless mute faces to the fraternal appeals and the friendly attempts to win them over preserved the same stiff passivity beneath this hail of abuse behind them the captain had drawn his sword and as the crowd pressed in on them more and more threatening to crush them against the wall 
he ordered them to present bayonets they obeyed and a double row of steel points were placed in front of the striker's breasts ah the bloody swine yelled mother brule drawing back but already they were coming on again in excited contempt of death the women were throwing themselves forward maheude and the levaque shouting kill us kill us then we want our rights levaque at the risk of getting cut had seized three bayonets in his hands shaking and pulling them in the effort to snatch them away he twisted them in the strength of his fury while bouteloup standing aside and annoyed at having followed his mate quietly watched him just come and look here said maheu just look a bit if you are good chaps and he opened his jacket and drew aside his shirt showing his naked breast with his hairy skin tattooed by coal he pressed on the bayonets compelling the soldiers to draw back terrible in his insolence and bravado one of them had pricked him in the chest and he became like a madman trying to make it enter deeper and to hear his ribs crack cowards you don't dare there are ten thousand behind us yes you can kill us there are ten thousand more of us to kill yet the position of the soldiers was becoming critical for they had received strict orders not to make use of their weapons until the last extremity and how were they to prevent these furious people from impaling themselves besides the space was getting less they were now pushed back against the wall and it was impossible to draw further back their little troop a mere handful of men opposed to the rising flood of miners still held its own however and calmly executed the brief orders given by the captain the latter with keen eyes and nervously compressed lips only feared lest they should be carried away by this abuse already a young sergeant a tall lean fellow whose thin moustache was bristling up was blinking his eyes in a disquieting manner near him an old soldier with tanned skin and stripes one in twenty campaigns had grown pale when he saw his bayonet twisted like a straw another doubtless a recruit still smelling the fields became very red every time he heard himself called scum and riff-raff and the violence did not cease the outstretched fists the abominable words the shovelfuls of accusations and threats which buffeted their faces it required all the force of order to keep them thus with mute faces in the proud gloomy silence of military discipline a collision seemed inevitable when captain richomme appeared from behind the troop with his benevolent white head overwhelmed by emotion he spoke out loudly by god this is idiotic such tomfoolery can't go on and he threw himself between the bayonets and the miners mates listen to me you know that i am an old workman and that i have always been one of you well by god i promise you that if they're not just with you i'm the man to go and say to the bosses how things lie but this is too much it does no good at all to howl bad names of these good fellows and try and get your bellies ripped up they listened hesitating but up above unfortunately little negrel's short profile reappeared he feared no doubt that he would be accused of sending a captain in place of venturing out himself and he tried to speak but his voice was lost in the midst of so frightful a tumult that he had to leave the window again simply shrugging his shoulders Richomme then found it vain to entreat them in his own name and to repeat that the thing must be arranged between mates they repelled him suspecting him but he was obstinate and remained amongst them by god let them break my head as well as yours for i don't leave you while you are so foolish etienne whom he begged to help him in making them hear reason made a gesture of powerlessness it was too late there were now more than five hundred of them and besides the madmen who were rushing up to chase away the barains some came out of inquisitiveness or to joke and amuse themselves over the battle in the midst of one group at some distance zacharie and philomene were looking on as at a theatre so peacefully that they had brought their children achille and desiree another stream was arriving from Requillard, including moquet and moquette the former at once went on 
grinning to slap his friend zacharie on the back while moquette in a very excited condition rushed to the first rank of the evil disposed every minute however the captain looked down the montsou road the desired reinforcements had not arrived and his sixty men could hold out no longer at last it occurred to him to strike the imagination of the crowd and he ordered his men to load the soldiers executed the order but the disturbance increased the blustering and the mockery ah those shammers they're going off to the target jeered the women the brule the levaque and the others maheude with her breast covered by the little body of estelle who was awake and crying came so near that the sergeant asked her what she was going to do with that poor little brat what the devil's that to do with you she replied fire at it if you dare the men shook their heads with contempt none believed that they would fire on them there are no balls in their cartridges said levaque are we cossacks cried maheu you don't fire against frenchmen by god others said that when people had been through the crimean campaign they were not afraid of lead and all continued to thrust themselves on to the rifles if firing had begun at this moment the crowd would have been mown down in the front rank moquette was choking with fury thinking that the soldiers were going to gash the women's skins she had spat out all her coarse words at them and could find no vulgarity low enough when suddenly having nothing left but that mortal offence with which to bombard the faces of the troop she exhibited her backside with both hands she raised her skirts bent her back and expanded the enormous rotundity here that's for you and it's a lot too clean you dirty blackguards she ducked and butted so that each might have his share repeating after each thrust there's for the officer there's for the sergeant there's for the soldiers a tempest of laughter arose bebert and lydie were in convulsions etienne himself in spite of his sombre expectation applauded this insulting nudity all of them the banterers as well as the infuriated were now hooting the soldiers as though they had seen them stained by a splash of filth catherine only standing aside on some old timber remained silent with the blood at her heart slowly carried away by the hatred that was rising within her but a hustling took place to calm the excitement of his men the captain decided to make prisoners with a leap moquette escaped saving herself between the legs of her comrades three miners levaque and two others were seized among the more violent and kept in sight at the other end of the captain's room negrel and dansart above were shouting to the captain to come in and take refuge with them he refused he felt that these buildings with their doors without locks would be carried by assault and that he would undergo the shame of being disarmed his little troop was already growling with impatience it was impossible to flee before these wretches in sabots the sixty with their backs to the wall and their rifles loaded again faced the mob at first there was a recoil followed by deep silence the strikers were astonished at this energetic stroke then a cry arose calling for the prisoners demanding their immediate release some voices said that they were being murdered in there and without any attempt at concerted action carried away by the same impulse of the same desire for revenge they all ran to the piles of bricks which stood near those bricks for which the marly soil supplied the clay and which were baked on the spot the children brought them one by one and the women filled their skirts with them every one soon had her ammunition at her feet and the battle of stones began it was mother brule who sat up to first she broke the bricks on the sharp edge of her knee and with both hands she discharged the two fragments the levaque woman was almost putting her shoulders out being so large and soft that she had to come near to get her aim in spite of bottle-loops entreaties and he dragged her back in the hope of being able to lead her away now that her husband had been taken off they all grew excited and moquette tired of making herself bleed by breaking the bricks over her over thighs preferred to throw them whole even the youngsters came into line and bebert showed lydie how the brick ought to be sent 
from under the elbow it was a shower of enormous hailstones producing low thuds and suddenly in the midst of these furies catherine was observed with her fists in the air also brandishing half bricks and throwing them with all the force of her little arms she could not have said why she was suffocating she was dying of the desire to kill everybody would it not soon be done with this cursed life of misfortune she had had enough of it beaten and driven away by her man wandering about like a lost dog in the mud of the roads without being able to ask a crust from her father who was starving like herself things never seemed to get better they were getting worse ever since she could remember and she broke the bricks and threw them before her with the one idea of sweeping everything away her eyes so blinded that she could not even see whose jaws she might be crushing etienne who had remained in front of the soldiers nearly had his skull broken his ear was grazed and turning round he started when he realized that the brick had come from catherine's feverish hands but at the risk of being killed he remained where he was gazing at her many others also forgot themselves there absorbed in the battle with empty hands Mouquet criticized the blows as though he were looking on at a game of bouchon oh that was well struck and that other no luck he joked and with his elbow pushed zachary who was squabbling with philomene because he had boxed achilles and desiree's ears refusing to put them on his back so that they could see there were spectators crowded all along the road and at the top of the slope near the entrance to the settlement old bonnemort appeared resting on his stick motionless against the rust-coloured sky as soon as the first bricks were thrown captain richomme had again placed himself between the soldiers and the miners he was entreating the one party exhorting the other party careless of danger in such despair that large tears were flowing from his eyes it was impossible to hear his words in the midst of the tumult only his large grey moustache could be seen moving but the hail of bricks came faster the men were joining in following the example of the women then maheude noticed that maheude was standing behind the with empty hands and sombre air what's up with you she shouted are you a coward are you going to let your mates be carried off to prison ah if only i hadn't got this child you should see estelle who was clinging to her neck screaming prevented her from joining mother brule and the others and as her man did not seem to hear she kicked some bricks against his legs by god will you take that must i spit in your face before people to get your spirits up becoming very red he broke some bricks and threw them she lashed him on dazing him shouting behind him cries of death stifling her daughter against her breast with the spasm of her arms and he still moved forward until he was opposite the guns beneath the shower of stones the little troop was disappearing fortunately they struck too high and the wall was riddled what was to be done the idea of going in of turning their backs for a moment turned the captain's pale face purple but it was no longer possible they would be torn to pieces at the last movement a brick had just broken the peak of his cap drops of blood were running down his forehead several of his men were wounded and he felt that they were losing self-control in that unbridled instinct of self-defence when obedience to leaders ceases the sergeant had uttered a by god for his left shoulder had nearly been put out and his flesh bruised by a shock like the blow of a washerwoman's beetle against linen grazed twice over the recruit had his thumb smashed while his right knee was grazed were they to let themselves be worried much longer a stone having bounded back and struck the old soldier with the stripes beneath the belly his cheeks turned green and his weapon trembled as he stretched it out at the end of his lean arms three times the captain was on the point of ordering them to fire he was choked by anguish an endless struggle for several seconds set at odds in his mind all ideas and duties all his beliefs as a man and as a soldier the rain of bricks increased and he opened his mouth and was about to shout fire when the guns went off of themselves three shots at first then five then the roll of a volley then one by itself 
some time afterwards in the deep silence there was stupefaction on all sides they had fired and the gaping crowd stood motionless as yet unable to believe it but heart-rending cries arose while the bugle was sounded to cease firing and here was a mad panic the rush of cattle filled with grape-shot a wild flight through the mud bebert and lydy had fallen one on top of the other at the first three shots the little girl struck in the face the boy wounded beneath the left shoulder she was crushed and never stirred again but he moved seized her with both arms in the convulsions of his agony as if he wanted to take her again as he had taken her at the bottom of the black hiding-place where they had spent the past night and jeanlin who just then ran up from Requillard, still half asleep kicking about in the midst of the smoke saw him embrace his little wife and die the five other shots had brought down mother brule and captain Richon. struck in the back as he was entreating his mates he had fallen on to his knees and slipping on to one hip he was groaning on the ground with eyes still full of tears the old woman whose breast had been opened had fallen back stiff and crackling like a bundle of dry faggots stammering one last oath in the gurgling of blood but then the volley swept the field mowing down the inquisitive groups who were laughing at the battle a hundred paces off a ball entered moquet's mouth and threw him down with fractured skull at the feet of zacharie and philomene whose two youngsters were splashed with red drops at the same moment moquette received two balls in the belly she had seen the soldiers take aim and in an instinctive movement of her good nature she had thrown herself in front of catherine shouting out to her to take care she uttered a loud cry and fell on to her back overturned by the shock etienne ran up wishing to raise her and take her away but with a gesture she said it was all over then she groaned but without ceasing to smile at both of them as though she were glad to see them together now that she was going away all seemed to be over and the hurricane of balls was lost in the distance as far as the frontages of the settlement when the last shot isolated and delayed was fired maheu struck in the heart turned round and fell with his face down into a puddle black with coal maheu leant down in stupefaction eh hey, old man get up it's nothing is it her hands were engaged with estelle whom she had to put under one arm in order to turn her man's head say something where are you hurt his eyes were vacant and his mouth was slobbered with bloody foam she understood he was dead then she remained seated in the mud with her daughter under her arm like a bundle gazing at her old man with a besotted air the pit was free with a nervous movement the captain had taken off and then put on his cap struck by a stone he preserved his pallid stiffness in face of the disaster of his life while his men with mute faces were reloading the frightened faces of negrel and dansart could be seen at the window of the receiving room souverain was behind them with a deep wrinkle on his forehead as though the nail of his fixed idea had printed itself there threateningly on the other side of the horizon at the edge of the plain bonmort had not moved supported by one hand on his stick the other hand up to his brows to see better the murder of his people below the wounded were howling the dead were growing cold in twisted postures muddy with the liquid mud of the thaw here and there forming puddles among the inky patches of coal which reappeared beneath the tattered snow and in the midst of these human corpses all small poor and lean in their wretchedness lay trompette's carcass a monstrous and pitiful mass of dead flesh etienne had not been killed he was still waiting beside catherine who had fallen from fatigue and anguish when a sonorous voice made him start it was abbe ranvier who was coming back after saying mass and who with both arms in the air with the inspired fury of a prophet was calling the wrath of god down on the murderers he foretold the era of justice 
the approaching extermination of the middle class by fire from heaven since it was bringing its crimes to a climax by massacring the workers and the disinherited of the world End of section thirty four section thirty five of germinal by emile zola translation by havelock ellis this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard part seven chapter one the shots fired at monceau had reached as far as paris with a formidable echo for four days all the opposition journals had been indignant displaying atrocious narratives on their front pages twenty-five wounded fourteen dead including three women and two children and there were prisoners taken as well Lavaque had become a sort of hero and was credited with a reply of antique sublimity to the examining magistrate the empire hit in mid-career by these few balls affected the calm of omnipotence without itself realizing the gravity of its wound it was simply an unfortunate collision something lost over there in the black country very far from the parisian boulevards which formed public opinion it would soon be forgotten the company had received official intimation to hush up the affair and to put an end to a strike which from its irritating duration was becoming a social danger so on wednesday morning three of the directors appeared at monceau the little town sick at heart which had not dared hitherto to rejoice over the massacre now breathed again and tasted the joy of being saved the weather too had become fine there was a bright sun one of those first february days which with their moist warmth tip the lilac shoots with green all the shutters had been flung back at the administration building the vast structure seemed alive again and cheering rumors were circulating it was said that the directors deeply affected by the catastrophe had rushed down to open their paternal arms to the wanderers from the settlements now that the blow had fallen a more vigorous one doubtless than they had wished for they were prodigal in their task of relief and decreed measures that were excellent though tardy first of all they sent away the borangs and made much of this extreme concession to their workmen then they put an end to the military occupation of the pits which were no longer threatened by the crushed strikers they also obtained silence regarding the sentinel who had disappeared from the barreau the district had been searched without finding either the gun or the corpse and although there was a suspicion of crime it was decided to consider the soldier a deserter in every way they thus tried to attenuate matters trembling with fear for the morrow judging it dangerous to acknowledge the irresistible savagery of a crowd set free amid the falling structure of the old world and besides this work of conciliation did not prevent them from bringing purely administrative affairs to a satisfactory conclusion for Denilin had been seen to return to the administration buildings where he met m hombeau the negotiations for the purchase of vandame continued and it was considered certain that Denilin would accept the company's offers but what particularly stirred the country were the great yellow posters which the directors had stuck up in profusion on the walls on them were to be read these few lines in very large letters workers of monceau we do not wish that the errors of which you have lately seen the sad effects should deprive sensible and willing workmen of their livelihood we shall therefore reopen all the pits on monday morning and when work is resumed we shall examine with care and consideration those cases in which there may be room for improvement we shall in fact do all that is just or possible to do in one morning the ten thousand colliers passed before these placards not one of them spoke many shook their heads others went away with trailing steps without changing one line in their motionless faces 
up to now the settlement of the dauson quarant had persisted in its fierce resistance it seemed that the blood of their mates which had reddened the mud of the pit was barricading the road against the others scarcely a dozen had gone down merely perron and some sneaks of his sort whose departure and arrival were gloomily watched without a gesture or a threat therefore a deep suspicion greeted the placard stuck on to the church nothing was said about the return certificates in that would the company refuse to take them on again and the fear of retaliations the fraternal idea of protesting against the dismissal of the more compromised men made them all obstinate still it was dubious they would see they would return to the pit when these gentlemen were good enough to put things plainly silence crushed the low houses hunger itself seemed nothing all might die now that violent death had passed over their roofs but one house that of the Nihis, remained especially black and mute in its overwhelming grief since she had followed her man to the cemetery Mehud kept her teeth clenched after the battle she had allowed etienne to bring back catherine muddy and half dead and as she was undressing her before the young man in order to put her to bed she thought for a moment that her daughter also had received a ball in the belly for the chemise was marked with large patches of blood but she soon understood that it was the flood of puberty which was at last breaking out in the shock of this abominable day ah another piece of luck that wound a fine present to be able to make children for the gendarmes to kill and she never spoke to catherine nor did she indeed talk to etienne the latter slept with jeanlin at the risk of being arrested seized by such horror at the idea of going back to the darkness of the irregulard that he would have preferred a prison a shudder shook him the horror of the night after all those deaths an unacknowledged fear of the little soldier who slept down there underneath the rocks besides he dreamed of a prison as of a refuge in the midst of the torment of his defeat but they did not trouble him and he dragged on his wretched hours not knowing how to weary out his body only at times Mehud looked at both of them at him and her daughter with a spiteful air as though she were asking them what they were doing in her house once more they were all snoring in a heap father von morton occupied the former bed of the two youngsters who slept with catherine now that poor elzir no longer dug her hump into her big sister's ribs it was when going to bed that the mother felt the emptiness of the house by the coldness of her bed which was now too large in vain she took estelle to fill the vacancy that did not replace her man and she wept quietly for hours then the days began to pass by as before always without bread but without the luck to die outright things picked up here and there rendered to the wretches the poor service of keeping them alive nothing had changed in their existence only her man was gone on the afternoon of the fifth day etienne made miserable by the sight of this silent woman left the room and walked slowly along the paved street of the settlement the inaction which weighed on him impelled him to take constant walks with arms swinging idly and lowered head always tortured by the same thought he tramped thus for half an hour when he felt by an increase in his discomfort that his mates were coming to their doors to look at him his little remaining popularity had been driven to the winds by that fusillade and he never passed now without meeting fiery looks which pursued him when he raised his head there were threatening men there women drawing aside the curtains from their windows and beneath this still silent accusation and the restrained anger of these eyes enlarged by hunger and tears he became awkward and could scarcely walk straight these dumb reproaches seemed to be always increasing behind him he became so terrified lest he should hear the entire settlement come out to shout its wretchedness at him that he returned shuddering but at the mahirs the scene which met him still further agitated him old bonnemort 
was near the cold fireplace nailed to his chair ever since two neighbors on the day of the slaughter had found him on the ground with his stick broken struck down like an old thunder-stricken tree and while lenore and henri to beguile their hunger were scraping with deafening noise an old saucepan in which cabbages had been boiled the day before Mehude, after having placed estelle on the table was standing up threatening catherine with her fist say that again by god just dare to say that again catherine had declared her intention to go back to the bureau the idea of not gaining her bread of being thus tolerated in her mother's house like a useless animal that is in the way was becoming every day more unbearable and if it had not been for the fear of chaval she would have gone down on tuesday she said again stammering what would you have we can't go on doing nothing we should get bread anyhow maheude interrupted her listen to me the first one of you who goes to work i'll do for you no that would be too much to kill the father and go on taking it out of the children i've had enough of it i'd rather see you all put in your coffins like him that's gone already and her long silence broke out into a furious flood of words a fine sum catherine would bring her hardly thirty sous to which they might add twenty sous if the bosses were good enough to find work for that brigand john lynn fifty sous and seven mouths to feed the brats were only good to swallow soup as to the grandfather he must have broken something in his brain when he fell for he seemed imbecile unless it had turned his blood to see the soldiers firing at his mates that's it old man isn't it they've quite done for you it's no good having your hands still strong you're done for von mort looked at her with his dim eyes without understanding he remained for hours with fixed gaze having no intelligence now except to spit into a plate filled with ashes which was put beside him for cleanliness and they've not settled his pension either she went on and i'm sure they won't give it because of our ideas no i tell you that we've had too much to do with those people who bring ill luck but catherine ventured to say they promise on the placard just let me alone with your damned placard more bird line for catching us and eating us they can be mighty kind now that they have ripped us open but where shall we go mother they won't keep us at the settlement sure enough maheude made a vague terrified gesture where should they go she did not know at all she avoided thinking it made her mad they would go elsewhere somewhere and as the noise of the saucepan was becoming unbearable she turned round on lenore and henri and boxed their ears the fall of estelle who had been crawling on all fours increased the disturbance the mother quieted her with a push a good thing if it had killed her she spoke of alzire she wished the others might have that child's luck then suddenly she burst out into loud sobs with her head against the wall etienne who was standing by did not dare to interfere he no longer counted for anything in the house and even the children drew back from him suspiciously but the unfortunate woman's tears went to his heart and he murmured come come courage we must try to get out of it she did not seem to hear him and was bemoaning herself now in a low continuous complaint ah the wretchedness is it possible things did go on before these horrors we ate our bread dry but we were all together and what has happened good god what have we done then that we should have such troubles some under the earth and the others with nothing left but too long to get there too it's true enough that they harnessed us like horses to work and it's not at all a just sharing of things to be always getting the stick and making rich people's fortunes bigger without hope of ever tasting the good things there's no pleasure in life when hope goes yes they couldn't have gone on longer we had to breathe a bit if we had only known is it possible to make oneself so wretched through wanting justice 
sighs swelled her breast and her voice choked with immense sadness then there are always some clever people there who promise you that everything can be arranged by just taking a little trouble then one loses one's head and one suffers so much from things as they are that one asks for things that can't be now i was dreaming like a fool i seemed to see a life of good friendship with everybody i went off into the air my faith into the clouds and then one breaks one's back when one tumbles down into the mud again it's not true there's nothing over there of the things that people tell of what there is is only wretchedness ah wretchedness as much as you like of it and bullets into the bargain etienne listened to this lamentation and every tear struck him with remorse he knew not what to say to calm Mehue, broken by her terrible fall from the heights of the ideal she had come back to the middle of the room and was now looking at him she addressed him with contemptuous familiarity in a last cry of rage and you do you talk of going back to the pit too after driving us out of the bloody place i've nothing to reproach you with but if i were in your shoes i should be dead of grief by now after causing such harm to the mates he was about to reply but then shrugged his shoulders in despair what was the good of explaining for she would not understand in her grief and he went away for he was suffering too much and resumed his wild walk outside there again he found the settlement apparently waiting for him the men at the doors the women at the windows as soon as he appeared growls were heard and the crowd increased the breath of gossip which had been swelling for four days was breaking out in a universal malediction fists were stretched towards him mothers spitefully pointed him out to their boys old men spat as they looked at him it was the change which follows on the morrow of defeat the fatal reverse of popularity an execration exasperated by all the suffering endured without result he had to pay for famine and death zacharie who came up with philomene hustled at the end as he went out grinning maliciously well he gets fat it's filling then to live on other people's deaths the levaque woman had already come to her door with bateloup she spoke of bebert her youngster killed by a bullet and cried yes there are cowards who get children murdered let him go and look for mine in the earth if he wants to give it me back she was forgetting her man in prison for the household was going on since bateloup remained but she thought of him however and went on in a shrill voice get along get along rascals may walk about while good people are put away and avoiding her etienne tumbled on to pierron who was running up across the gardens she had regarded her mother's death as a deliverance for the old woman's violence threatened to get them hanged nor did she weep over pierron's little girl that street marker lydie a good riddance but she joined in with her neighbors with the idea of getting reconciled with them and my mother eh and the little girl you were seen you were hiding yourself behind them when they cut the lead instead of you what was to be done strangle Perron and the others and fight the whole settlement at the end wanted to do so for a moment the blood was throbbing in his head he now looked upon his mates as brutes he was irritated to see them so unintelligent and barbarous that they wanted to revenge themselves on him for the logic of facts how stupid it all was and he felt disgust at his powerlessness to tame them again and satisfied himself with hastening his steps as though he were deaf to abuse soon it became a flight every house hooted him as he passed they hastened on his heels it was a whole nation cursing him with a voice that was becoming like thunder in its overwhelming hatred it was he the exploiter the murderer who was the sole cause of their misfortune he rushed out of the settlement pale and terrified with this yelling crowd behind his back when he at last reached the main road most of them left him but a few persisted until at the bottom of the slope before the advantage he met another group coming from the Voreux. old mock and cheval were there 
since the death of his daughter moquette and of his son moquet the old man had continued to act as groom without a word of regret or complaint suddenly when he saw at the end he was shaken by fury tears broke out from his eyes and a flood of coarse words burst from his mouth black and bleeding from his habit of chewing tobacco you devil you bloody swine you filthy snout wait you've got to pay me for my poor children you'll have to come to it he picked up a brick broke it and threw both pieces yes yes clear him off shouted chaval who was grinning in excitement delighted at this vengeance everyone gets his turn now you're up against the wall you dirty hound and he also attacked etienne with stones a savage clamour arose they all took up bricks broke them and threw them to rip him open as they would like to have done to the soldiers he was dazed and could not flee he faced them trying to calm them with phrases his old speeches once so warmly received came back to his lips he repeated the words with which he had intoxicated them at the time when he could keep them in hand like a faithful flock but his power was dead and only stones replied to him he had just been struck on the left arm and was drawing back in great peril when he found himself hemmed in against the front of the advantage for the last few moments rasseneur had been at his door come in he said simply etienne hesitated it choked him to take refuge there come in then i'll speak to them he resigned himself and took refuge at the other end of the parlour while the innkeeper filled up the doorway with his broad shoulders look here my friends just be reasonable you know very well that i've never deceived you i've always been in favour of quietness and if you had listened to me you certainly wouldn't be where you are now rolling his shoulders and belly he went on at length allowing his facile eloquence to flow with a lulling gentleness of warm water and all his old success came back he regained his popularity naturally and without an effort as if he had never been hooted and called a coward a month before voices arose in approval very good we are with you that is the way to put it thundering applause broke out etienne in the background grew faint and there was bitterness at his heart he recalled rasseneur's prediction in the forest threatening him with the ingratitude of the mob what imbecile brutality what an abominable forgetfulness of old services it was a blind force which constantly devoured itself and beneath his anger at seeing these brutes spoil their own cause there was despair at his own fall and the tragic end of his ambition what was it already done for he remembered hearing beneath the beeches three thousand hearts beating to the echo of his own on that day he had held his popularity in both hands those people belonged to him he felt that he was their master mad dreams had then intoxicated him Monceau at his feet paris beyond becoming a deputy perhaps crushing the middle class in a speech the first speech ever pronounced by a workman in a parliament and it was all over he awakened miserable and detested his people were dismissing him by flinging bricks rasseneur's voice rose higher never will violence succeed the world can't be remade in a day those who have promised you to change it all at one stroke are either making fun of you or they are rascals bravo bravo shouted the crowd who then was the guilty one and this question which etienne put to himself overwhelmed him more than ever was it in fact his fault this misfortune which was making him bleed the wretchedness of some the murder of others these women these children lean and without bread he had had that lamentable vision one evening before the catastrophe but then a force was lifting him he was carried away with his mates besides he had never led them it was they who led him who obliged him to do things which he would never have done if it were not for the shock of that crowd pushing behind him at each new violence he had been stupefied by the course of events for he had neither foreseen nor desired any of them 
could he anticipate for instance that his followers in the settlement would one day stone him these infuriated people lied when they accused him of having promised them an existence all fodder and laziness and in this justification in this reasoning in which he had tried to fight against his remorse was hidden the anxiety that he had not risen to the height of his task it was the doubt of the half-cultured man still perplexing him but he felt himself at the end of his courage he was no longer at heart with his mates he feared this enormous mass of the people blind and irresistible moving like a force of nature sweeping away everything outside rules and theories a certain repugnance was detaching him from them the discomfort of his new tastes the slow movement of all his being towards a superior class at this moment rasseneur's voice was lost in the midst of enthusiastic shouts hurrah for rasseneur he's the fellow bravo bravo the innkeeper shut the door while the band dispersed and the two men looked at each other in silence they both shrugged their shoulders they finished up by having a drink together on the same day there was a great dinner at Pialang. they were celebrating the betrothal of negrel and cecile since the previous evening the gregoires had had the dining-room waxed and the drawing-room dusted melanie reigned in the kitchen watching over the roasts and stirring the sauces the odour of which ascended to the attics it had been decided that francis the coachman should help honorine to wait the gardener's wife would wash up and the gardener would open the gate never had the substantial patriarchal old house been in such a state of gaiety everything went off beautifully madame hennebeau was charming with cecile and she smiled at negrel when the mousseau lawyer gallantly proposed the health of the future household m hennebeau was also very amiable his smiling face struck the guests the report circulated that he was rising in favour with the directors and that he would soon be made an officer of the legion of honour on account of the energetic manner in which he had put down the strike nothing was said about recent events but there was an air of triumph in the general joy and the dinner became the official celebration of a victory at last then they were saved and once more they could begin to eat and sleep in peace a discreet allusion was made to those dead whose blood the voreux mud had yet scarcely drunk up it was a necessary lesson and they were all affected when the gregoires added that it was now the duty of all to go and heal the wounds in the settlements they had regained their benevolent placidity excusing their grave miners whom they could already see again at the bottom of the mines giving a good example of everlasting resignation the Monceau notables who had now left off trembling agreed that this question of the wage system ought to be studied cautiously the roasts came on and the victory became complete when m hennebeau read a letter from the bishop announcing abbe ranvier's removal the middle class throughout the province had been roused to anger by the story of this priest who treated the soldiers as murderers and when the dessert appeared the lawyer resolutely declared that he was a free thinker deneulin was there with his two daughters in the midst of the joy he forced himself to hide the melancholy of his ruin that very morning he had signed the sale of his vandame concession to the monceau company with the night at his throat he had submitted to the directors demands at last giving up to them that prey that had been on the watch for so long scarcely obtaining from them the money necessary to pay off his creditors he had even accepted as a lucky chance at the last moment their offer to keep him as divisional engineer thus resigning himself to watch as a simple salaried servant over that pit which had swallowed up his fortune it was the knell of small personal enterprises the approaching disappearance of the masters eaten up one by one by the ever-hungry ogre of capital drowned in the rising flood of great companies he alone paid the expenses of the strike he understood that they were drinking to his disaster when they drank to m hennebeau's rosette and he only consoled himself a little 
when he saw the fine courage of lucy and jean who looked charming in their dun-up toilettes laughing at the downfall like happy tomboys disdainful of money when they passed into the drawing-room for coffee m gregoire drew his cousin aside and congratulated him on the courage of his decision what would you have your real mistake was to risk the million of your monceau denier over van damme you gave yourself a terrible wound and it has melted away in that dog's labour while mine which was not stirred from my drawer still keeps me comfortably doing nothing as it will keep my grandchildren's children End of section thirty five section thirty six of german Om by emil zola translation by havelock ellis this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by map part seven chapter two on sunday etienne escaped from the settlement at nightfall a very clear sky sprinkled with stars lit up the earth with a blue haze of twilight he went down towards the canal and followed the bank slowly in the direction of marsh End. it was his favourite walk a grass-covered path two leagues long passing straight beside this geometrical waterway which unrolled itself like an endless ingot of molten silver he never met any one there but on this day he was vexed to see a man come up to him beneath the pale starlight the two solitary walkers only recognized each other when they were face to face what is it you said etienne souverain nodded his head without replying for a moment they remained motionless then side by side they set out towards marchiennes each of them seemed to be continuing his own reflections as though they were far away from each other have you seen in the paper about pluchart's success at paris asked etienne at length after that meeting at belleville they waited for him on the pavement and gave him an ovation oh he's afloat now in spite of his sore throat he can do what he likes in the future the engine man shrugged his shoulders he felt contempt for fine talkers fellows who go into politics as one goes to the bar to get an income out of phrases etienne was now studying darwin he had read fragments summarized and popularized in a five sous volume and out of this ill-understood reading he had gained for himself a revolutionary idea of the struggle for existence the lean eating the fat the strong people devouring the pallid middle class but souverain furiously attacked the stupidity of the socialists who accept darwin that apostle of scientific inequality whose famous selection was only good for aristocratic philosophers his mate persisted however wishing to reason out the matter and expressing his doubts by an hypothesis supposing the old society were no longer to exist swept away to the crumbs well was it not to be feared that the new world would grow up again slowly spoilt by the same injustices some sick and others flourishing some more skilful and intelligent fattening on everything and others imbecile and lazy becoming slaves again but before this vision of eternal wretchedness the engine man shouted out fiercely that if justice was not possible with man then man must disappear for every rotten society there must be a massacre until the last creature was exterminated and there was silence again for a long time with sunken head souverain walked over the short grass so absorbed that he kept to the extreme edge by the water with the quiet certainty of a sleepwalker on a roof then he shuddered causelessly as though he had stumbled against a shadow his eyes lifted and his face was very pale he said softly to his companion did i ever tell you how she died whom do you mean my wife over there in russia etienne made a vague gesture astonished at the tremor in his voice and at the sudden desire for confidence in this lad who was usually so impassive in his stoical detachment from others and from himself he only knew that the woman was his mistress and that 
she had been hanged in moscow the affair hadn't gone off souverine said with eyes still vacantly following the white stream of the canal between the bluish colonnades of tall trees we had been a fortnight at the bottom of a hole undermining the railway and it was not the imperial train that was blown up it was a passenger train then they arrested anotchka she brought us bread every evening disguised as a peasant woman she lit the fuse too because a man might have attracted attention i followed the trial hidden in the crowd for six days his voice became thick and he coughed as though he were choking twice i wanted to cry out and to rush over the people's heads to join her but what was the good one man less would be one soldier less and i could see that she was telling me not to come when her large eyes met mine he coughed again on the last day in the square i was there it was raining they stupidly lost their heads put out by the falling rain it took twenty minutes to hang the other four the cord broke they could not finish the fourth Anochka was standing up waiting she could not see me she was looking for me in the crowd i got on to a post and she saw me and our eyes never turned from each other when she was dead she was still looking at me i waved my hat i came away there was silence again the white road of the canal unrolled to the far distance and they both walked with the same quiet step as though each had fallen back into his isolation at the horizon the pale water seemed to open the sky with a little hole of light it was our punishment souverain went on roughly we were guilty to love each other yes it is well that she is dead heroes will be born from her blood and i no longer have any cowardice at my heart ah nothing neither parents nor wife nor friend nothing to make my hand tremble on the day when i must take others lives or give up my own etienne had stopped shuddering in the cool night he discussed no more he simply said we have gone far shall we go back they went back towards the baroque slowly and he added after a few paces have you seen the new placards the company had that morning put up some more large yellow posters they were clearer and more conciliatory and the company undertook to take back the certificates of those miners who went down on the following day everything would be forgotten and pardon was offered even to those who were most implicated yes i've seen replied the engine man well what do you think of it i think that it's all up the flock will go down again you are all too cowardly at the end feverishly excused his mates a man may be brave a mob which is dying of hunger has no strength step by step they were returning to the Voreux, and before the black mass of the pit he continued swearing that he at least would never go down but he could forgive those who did then as the rumour ran that the carpenters had not had time to repair the tubbing he asked for information was it true had the weight of the soil against the timber which formed the internal skirt of scaffolding to the shaft so pushed it in that the winding cages rubbed as they went down for a length of over fifty metres souverain who once more became uncommunicative replied briefly he had been working the day before and the cage did in fact jar the engineman had even had to double the speed to pass that spot but all the bosses received any observations with the same irritating remark if it was cold they wanted that could be repaired later on you see that will smash up etienne murmured it will be a fine time with eyes vaguely fixed on the pit in the shadow souverain quietly concluded if it does smash up the mates will know it since you advise them to go down again nine o'clock struck at the Monceau steeple and his companion having said that he was going to bed he added without putting out his hand well good-bye i'm going away what you're going away yes i've asked for my certificate back i'm going elsewhere etienne stupefied and affected looked at him after walking for two hours he said that to him and in so calm a voice while the mere announcement of this sudden separation made his whole heart ache 
they had got to know each other they had toiled together that always makes one sad the idea of not seeing a person again you're going away and where do you go over there i don't know at all but i shall see you again no i think not they were silent and remained for a moment facing each other without finding anything to say then good-bye good-bye while etienne ascended toward the settlement souverine turned and again went along the canal bank and there now alone he continued to walk with sunken head so lost in the darkness that he seemed merely a moving shadow of the night now and then he stopped he counted the hours that struck afar when he heard midnight strike he left the bank and turned towards the Voreux. at that time the pit was empty and he only met a sleepy-eyed captain it was not until two o'clock that they would begin to get up steam to resume work first he went to take from a cupboard a jacket which he pretended to have forgotten various tools a drill armed with its screw a small but very strong saw a hammer and a chisel were rolled up in this jacket then he left but instead of going out through the shed he passed through the narrow corridor which led to the ladder passage with his jacket under his arm he quietly went down without a lamp measuring the depth by counting the ladders he knew that the cage jarred at three hundred and seventy four meters against the fifth row of the lower tubbing when he had counted fifty four ladders he put out his hand and was able to feel the swelling of the planking it was there then with the skill and coolness of a good workman who has been reflecting over his task for a long time he set to work he began by sawing a panel in the brattice so as to communicate with the winding shaft with the help of matches quickly lighted and blown out he was then able to ascertain the condition of the tubbing and of the recent repairs between calais and valenciennes the sinking of mine shafts was surrounded by immense difficulties on account of the masses of subterranean water in great sheets at the level of the lowest valleys only the construction of tubbings frameworks jointed like the stays of a barrel could keep out the springs which flow in and isolate the shafts in the midst of the lakes which with deep obscure waves beat against the walls it had been necessary in sinking the bureau to establish two tubbings that of the upper level in the shifting sands and white clays bordering the chalky stratum and fissured in every part swollen with water like a sponge then that of the lower level immediately above the coal stratum in a yellow sand as fine as flour flowing with liquid fluidity it was here that the torrent was to be found that subterranean sea so dreaded in the coal pits of the nord a sea with its storms and its shipwrecks an unknown and unfathomable sea rolling its dark floods more than three hundred meters beneath the daylight usually the tubbings resisted the enormous pressure the only thing to be dreaded was the piling up of the neighboring soil shaken by the constant movement of the old galleries which were filling up in this descent of the rocks lines of fracture were sometimes produced which slowly extended as far as the scaffolding at last perforating it and pushing it into the shaft and there was the great danger of a landslip and a flood filling the pit with an avalanche of earth and a deluge of springs souverain sitting astride in the opening he had made discovered a very serious defect in the fifth row of tubbing the wood was bellied out from the framework several planks had even come out of their shoulder pieces abundant filtrations pichot the miners call them were jetting out of the joints through the tarred oaken with which they were caulked the carpenters pressed for time had been content to place iron squares at the angles so carelessly that not all the screws were put in a considerable movement was evidently going on behind in the sand of the torrent then with his wimble he unscrewed the squares so that another push would tear them all off it was a foolhardy task during which he frequently only just escaped from falling headlong down the hundred and eighty meters which separated him from the bottom he had been obliged to seize the oak guides 
the joists along which the cages slid and suspended over the void he traversed the length of the cross-beams with which they were joined from point to point slipping along sitting down turning over simply buttressing himself on an elbow or a knee with tranquil contempt of death a breath would have sent him over and three times he caught himself up without a shudder first he felt with his hand and then worked only lighting a match when he lost himself in the midst of these slimy beams after loosening the screws he attacked the wood itself and the peril became still greater he had sought for the key the piece which held the others he attacked it furiously making holes in it sawing it thinning it so that it lost its resistance while through the holes and the cracks the water which escaped in small jets blinded him and soaked him in icy rain two matches were extinguished they all became damp and then there was night the bottomless depth of darkness from this moment he was seized by rage the breath of the invisible intoxicated him the black horror of this rain-beaten hole urged him to mad destruction he wreaked his fury at random against the tubbing striking where he could with his wimble with his saw seized by the desire to bring the whole thing at once down on his head he brought as much ferocity to the task as though he had been digging a knife into the skin of some execrated living creature who would kill the voreau at last that evil beast with ever open jaws which had swallowed so much human flesh the bite of his tools could be heard his spine lengthened he crawled climbed down then up again holding on by a miracle in continual movement the flight of a nocturnal bird amid the scaffolding of a belfry but he grew calm dissatisfied with himself why could not things be done coolly without haste he took breath and then went back into the latter passage stopping up the hole by replacing the panel which he had sawn that was enough he did not wish to raise the alarm by excessive damage which would have been repaired immediately the beast was wounded in the belly we should see if it was still alive at night and he had left his mark the frightened world would know that the beast had not died a natural death he took his time in methodically rolling up his tools in his jacket and slowly climbed up the ladders then when he had emerged from the pit without being seen it did not even occur to him to go and change his clothes three o'clock struck he remained standing on the road waiting at the same hour etienne who was not asleep was disturbed by a slight sound in the thick night of the room he distinguished the low breath of the children and the snoring of bonnemort and Mehu, while jeanlin near him was breathing with a prolonged flute-like whistle no doubt he had dreamed and he was turning back when the noise began again it was the creaking of a palliasse the stifled effort of someone who was getting up then he imagined that catherine must be ill i say is it you what is the matter he asked in a low voice no one replied and the snoring of the others continued for five minutes nothing stirred then there was fresh creaking feeling certain this time that he was not mistaken he crossed the room putting his hands out into the darkness to feel the opposite bed he was surprised to find the young girl sitting up holding in her breath awake and on the watch well why don't you reply what are you doing then at last she said i'm getting up getting up at this hour yes i'm going back to work at the pit etienne felt deeply moved and sat down on the edge of the palliasse while catherine explained her reasons to him she suffered too much by living thus in idleness feeling continual looks of reproach weighing on her she would rather run the risk of being knocked about down there by cheval and if her mother refused to take her money when she brought it well she was big enough to act for herself and make her own soup go away i want to dress and don't say anything will you if you want to be kind but he remained near her he had put his arms round her waist in a caress of grief and pity pressed one against the other in their shirts they could feel the warmth of each other's naked flesh at the edge of this bed still moist with a night's sleep 
she had at first tried to free herself then she began to cry quietly in her turn taking him by the neck to press him against her in a despairing clasp and they remained without any further desires with the past of their unfortunate love which they had not been able to satisfy was it then done with forever would they never dare to love each other some day now that they were free it only needed a little happiness to dissipate their shame that awkwardness which prevented them from coming together because of all sorts of ideas which they themselves could not read clearly go to bed again she whispered i don't want to light up it would wake mother it is time leave me he could not hear he was pressing her wildly with a heart drowned in immense sadness the need for peace an irresistible need for happiness was carrying him away and he saw himself married in a neat little house with no other ambition than to live and to die there both of them together he would be satisfied with bread and if there were only enough for one she should have it what was the good of anything else was there anything in life worth more but she was unfolding her naked arms please leave me then in a sudden impulse he said in her ear wait i'm coming with you and he was himself surprised at what he had said he had sworn never to go down again whence then came this sudden decision arising from his lips without thought of his without even a moment's discussion there was now such calm within him so complete a cure of his doubts that he persisted like a man saved by chance who has at last found the only harbour from his torment so he refused to listen to her when she became alarmed understanding that he was devoting himself for her and fearing the ill words which would greet him at the pit he laughed at everything the placards promised pardon and that was enough i want to work that's my idea let us dress and make no noise they dressed themselves in the darkness with a thousand precautions she had secretly prepared her miner's clothes the evening before he took a jacket and breeches from the cupboard and they did not wash themselves for fear of knocking the bowl all were asleep but they had to cross the narrow passage where the mother slept when they started as ill luck would have it they stumbled against a chair she woke and asked drowsily eh what is it catherine had stopped trembling and violently pressing etienne's hand it's me don't trouble yourself he said i feel stifled and am going outside to breathe a bit very well and Mahid fell asleep again catherine dared not stir at last she went down into the parlour and divided a slice of bread and butter which she had reserved from a loaf given by a monceau lady then they softly closed the door and went away souverine had remained standing near the advantage at the corner of the road for half an hour he had been looking at the colliers who were returning to work in the darkness passing by with the dull tramp of a herd he was counting them as a butcher counts his beasts at the entrance to the slaughter-house and he was surprised at their number even his pessimism had not foreseen that the number of cowards would have been so great the stream continued to pass by and he grew stiff very cold with clenched teeth and bright eyes but he started among the men passing by whose faces he could not distinguish he had just recognized one by his walk he came forward and stopped him where are you going to at the end in surprise instead of replying stammered what you've not set out yet then he confessed he was going back to the pit no doubt he had sworn only it could not be called life to wait with folded arms for things which would perhaps happen in a hundred years and besides reasons of his own had decided him souverain had listened to him shuddering he seized him by the shoulder and pushed him towards the settlement go home again i want you to do you understand but catherine having approached he recognized her also at the end protested declaring that he allowed no one to judge his conduct and the engine man's eyes went from the young girl to her companion while he stepped back with a sudden relinquishing movement when there was a woman in a man's heart 
that man was done for he might die perhaps he saw again in a rapid vision his mistress hanging over there at moscow that last link cut from his flesh which had rendered him free of the lives of others and of his own life he said simply go etienne feeling awkward was delaying and trying to find some friendly word so as not to separate in this manner then you're still going yes well give me your hand old chap a pleasant journey and no ill feeling the other stretched out an icy hand neither friend nor wife good-bye for good this time yes good-bye and Silverine, standing motionless in the darkness watched etienne and catherine entering the borough end of section thirty six